Welcome, connoisseurs of fine common cardboard, to today's last stream, and to this card your doom scourge. Let's go. Connoisseur is a fine common cardboard. We are here today with Let's Build for Cardoor Doom Scourge, the hardest of the demons. And I am so pumped to bring this. I am not the first to build Cardoor Doom Scourge, going all the way back to the memes and the dreams when Cardoor was considered absolute dog tier to the point where Cardoor was absolutely throttling the local meta at the tryhards and under the piloting of Nate Diggity7. Now, we've got something really exciting to explore today, and that is going to be basically taking this commander and applying a really exciting new deck building paradigm that I've been testing and exploring with in the context of this mid range deck. So, thank you all for joining me today. I hope you're having a great day out there. Hope you're enjoying that savage ass metal music. That's BFG Division by Mick Gordon for, of course, one of the most iconic first person shooter games, Doom. This is the Doom Eternal soundtrack song. That's the 11th song on the album. So if you don't know me, I love metal music. I love that heavy, grindy. Mm. So, yes, let me know if you can hear me in chat, if it's uh, all coming through clearly, if the audio is good. And we're going to get on with this deck build. So, here we go. We have Cardur Doom Scourge here in Moxfield. And the first thing I want to do with this deck is explain a little bit about why I'm revisiting this commander. I think that this commander is a fantastic counter to some of the most prevalent parts of the meta. It's a color pie combination that I absolutely love. And I think it has all the ingredients to really go the distance in CPDH, especially with this new, uh, with this new design paradigm that I have in mind. So first, we're going to go over to Twitter and we're going to take a quick peek at what I just posted today, which was a long graphic breakdown of exactly what I have in mind. So here we are. Let's talk recursion in black and reanimation in white and how it can dramatically increase the consistency of your CPDH decks and your casual decks. So essentially in the last couple of sets, we've gotten a fantastic array of new, uh, really playable cards that cycle themselves into the graveyard so that you can get a land. Now, particularly these are land type cyclers. They're cards that find islands, plains, swamps, mountains, and forests. And we've hit a critical mass of them. I would venture to guess that we're going to continue to get more of them into the future. And as we get more of them, this will become an even more powerful way of generating card advantage, ensuring the consistency of your game plan, and making sure you always hit your land drops and have a way to end the game in the late game. So we've got Soul Crusher. Welcome to the chat. I haven't seen you before, and I love your name. It's very on theme with the live stream that we've got going here. Soul Crusher says, I just started getting into CPDH. I'm building Tatiova right now. Well, Tatiova is a fantastic deck, a uh, fantastic commander. I think that there's a lot of different ways to build Tatiova right now too, which is super exciting. I think that there's even non-combo ways of building Tatiova that just lean into essentially having a massive source of card advantage and life gain in the command zone while playing big beaters and big Simic threats. So I hope you're having a good day out there and um, let's dive in. So recursion packages. So in black, we have this source of card advantage that isn't really being utilized 
as much as I think it should, and that is recursion out of the gra out of the graveyard. It's recursion and bringing creatures back that are dead and using them from our hand. Now, I want to speak to a particular deck builder who's been talking about this from some time, and that is our longest running patron, Noyark, who says that if it's good enough to play, it's good enough to kill, it's good enough to bring back from the graveyard and use again. Black in particular has this self-contained ecosystem, this package in black alone that allows you to do this. And I'm already experimenting with this um, it, to, to really positive effect in a number of different black decks, as well as a number of different white decks as well. So starting with black, we have cards like Reaping the Graves, we have Wander and Death, Blood Fountain, Unsealed the Necropolis, but the list doesn't end there. We have cards like, uh, uh, my brain literally just blanked. The card is Dig Up the Body. We have cards like Soul Stair Expedition. We have Font of Return. We have so many good cards in black that are ways to get these creatures back and reuse them for a second run. The reason some of these cards didn't really see a lot of play in the past was that you had to have something in the graveyard for them to be useful. So a card like Reaping the Graves could sit there in your hand dead for a really long time before you could use it. Same with Wander and Death, although Wander and Death does have cycling, which is really cool because the card also reads two colorless, draw a card. So if you get this at the beginning of the game and all you need to do is find a land, you can cycle it away to get that card and get closer to finding the resources you need. We've got Blood Fountain, um, which also has some usability early on. This kind of reads the same way. It's two mana loot, and then you're going to be able to get a card back. Unsealed and Acropolis is a newly printed card. Uh, allows you to get cards back from your graveyard at instant speed, two of them, while also having a way to avoid graveyard hate because you mill cards into the graveyard upon resolution, and then you choose cards from the graveyard that are there. So if somebody wipes your graveyard out in response to Unsealed and Acropolis, you actually get to pick from the three cards that get milled in, which means that there's a decent chance you'll actually be able to still draw two, although most likely it'll be a draw one at that point. So what I wrote here is, is basically that. Um, so let's go on to the next one here. Uh, we have, let's see if we go back here. We also have white reanimation. This is not as relevant to what we're doing today, but white is actually the color of reanimation in Popper Commander and in common in general. Uh, we have late to dinner, resurrection, breath of life, and false defeat. All four of these are zombify. They're just white zombify. Late to dinner, you actually get a food token back. And we've got Mizu Sun. I wonder how similar our builds are going to be. So chat, Mizu Sun recently posted their version of Cardur in the Common Connoisseurs Discord chat. And super glad to have you here, Mizu. Also one of our esteemed patrons and one of our financial contributors. And it was that combined with uh, looking back at Nate Diggity's old Cardur list and combined with this new black recursion package paired with the cycling creatures that got me into looking at this again. So Mizu, thanks for sharing your list. And we talked at length on Discord about exactly how to do this. I think our lists are gonna come out really, really similarly, but we'll just have to see. We got Soul Crusher says, there seems to be a lot of cool, uncommon legendary creatures in Loader. Absolutely. And right before I started this stream, I uploaded three, uh, three videos. Uh, one of them is this one. We're also going to be doing uh, Denethor, Ruling Steward, and we're going to be doing Elrond, uh, the Lord of Rivendell. So make sure to go and hit that Notify Me button, subscribe to the channel if you want to see those, and that'll let you know when we go live on those videos. So we've got content going out two weeks up until RIW Hobbies PDHCon, which is going to be on the weekend of the 24th. So Mizu says, I started with Clay's list at first and then mixed it with our discussion. Great. Yeah, and when I, and you know, actually, we're going to take a look at your list here on stream uh, before we get going. Um, although, uh, I don't want to look at it too much because the goal of this is to go through my deck building process and not really to mimic somebody else's thing. It's about showing you how I think about these decks and how I think about the sort of value ordering and the choices of how do you actually decide upon the end cards for the deck? What's the what are the best cards for the deck and the approach you want to take? So these white cards actually work really, really well with the cycling creatures because uh, while they don't offer card advantage on their, on their own, you're just taking something in the graveyard and you're getting it into play, you're more cheating on the mana. But 
when you're cycling those cards in, you either drew a card or you got a land off of it. And a lot of those lands, if it's a land cycler of a, of a, of a plains or some other basic land type, then you're actually getting another kind of value, which could be uh, a plus one, plus one counter from Idyllic Grange. It could be a Mystic Sanctuary to get a spell back. It could be a Witch's Cottage to get a creature back. It could be a Dwarven Mine to get a 1-1 one, one token or a Gingerbread Cabin to get a food token. So all of these things are really good. So it is card advantage when you pair it with these reanimation effects. So scrolling down, we have what to find. Now the first thing is you can just fix your mana. Like flat out, you can fix your mana perfectly by getting a dual land. And we have Idyllic, Beachfront, Contaminated Aquifer, Geothermal Bog, Wooded, Ridgeline, and Radiant Grove. We also have the Snow Duels. So these are great because at the early stages of the game, if you need an untapped land, you go get an untapped land. If you need a tap land, you want to just diversify your mana, you can do that as well. Soul Crusher says, my first popper deck was Mr. Orfeo. He is also pretty fun to play. Now, Soul Crusher, Mr. Orfeo is a really good place for what we're talking about right here. And there could be an argument for building a mid-range Orfeo deck completely around this mechanic because when you get three different, uh, three different colors, you're able to have essentially like probably around 12 really good four power or greater creatures. And for me and Mr. Orfeo, I only ever play four, creature, four power creatures. And the added benefit of it is that you're actually gonna have perfect mana. So you're gonna have perfect mana, you're gonna have all these creatures, you're gonna have ways to get them back from the graveyard, you're always gonna hit your land drops, and it's just gonna be incredibly consistent. Alex Scott says, what's up, Ryan? Dude, good to see you, Alex. Glad to have you here as always. Alex is one of our regulars. So you can get these dual lands with these cards. If we scroll down a little bit further, here are the lands that I was talking about that add that extra value to what we're doing. Um, they're very, very powerful. Uh, obviously, Mystic Sanctuary is a combo card, but alongside those, all of these do something relevant. Uh, Gingerbread Cabin, probably the least relevant of all of them. It tends to be a bit more incidental in a mono green deck or a very green heavy deck. But the food token is an artifact, which means that we can sacrifice that to things like Deadly Dispute and other powerful effects like that. Alex says, Skull Crusher, Clay and I are Tatiova connoisseurs. Would love to talk with you about it if you want it. Yeah, uh, Skull Crusher, you and Alex should definitely talk. Uh, Alex has played his version of Tatiova on our live stream and uh, did really, really well. So Golden Leaf, hey, good to see you, friend. Glad to have you here and I uh, hope you're having a great day out there. So yeah, here's the lands you can find with them. And in each one of these cycles, we actually have a lot of different uh, cards that can find these cards in particular. So a really good example is I'm using Idyllic Grange in, in uh, Shadowfax right now, and it helps get Shadowfax tutorably and uncounterably. I can find that plus one, plus one counter for Shadowfax to ensure that Shadowfax has five power, which means that I can put four power creatures into play off of Shadowfax, which we're gonna talk about a little bit too. And we're getting around to Cardur here, but I really wanna go through this first because this is the meat of this stream. Cardur is one place to apply this concept. It is not the only place, okay? This concept is any black or white deck. So yeah, dude, Golden Leaf says, I'm so excited to see Cardur. Well, dude, I'm, I'm excited to present it. This is gonna be really fun. Now, there's other forms of recursion that we can build around that are not uh, generally, that, that, are, that are black, but not necessarily black. Ha Haunted Fengraph is a good example of that. Um, but Witch's Cottage, Mortuary Mire, these are other lands that we can get back things from the graveyard with. So they're pretty free to play. Now in white, these aren't all of them, but here's a couple of examples. We have Alabaster Host Intercessor, Eagles of the North, Imposing Vantasaur, and Soul of Migration. There's also Noble Templar. Noble Templar is also a plain cycling card. Um, it just happens to be, in my opinion, maybe the lowest quality of them. Um, it's still a good card. It's a it's a six mana three six, which isn't, but it has vigilance, which isn't uh, incredible. Um, the reason we have cards like Imposing Vantasaur is because it's one mana draw one, or it's this three six, right? And so all of these cards, um, you can cycle away early, and then even if you're just in white, you can reanimate them on, and as early as turn four to bring a creature into play. 
Um, and they're all pretty amazing. Uh, Eagles of the North is a newly printed one from Lord of the Rings. This card gives all creatures you control plus one plus oh and first strike while also cycling for only one mana. So the really nice thing about this kind of an effect is you can go turn one land, turn two land uh, into an artifact rock, and then you can cycle it to get whatever land you need on the next one. So just in white, you can just play these and the reanimation cards. And there's other good stuff to reanimate too. Cards like Goliath Paladin, which is initiative. You can reanimate Palace Sentinels, which is the monarch. You can do all sorts of powerful stuff with these cards. Stonehorn Dignitary, another one that's really good. Um, and then Soul of Migration gets a honorable mention here for being an evoke card that you can cast early and then reanimate late. So moving on from there, we also have the stuff in blue. We have Tidal Terror, Stripe Riverwinder, Shoreline Ranger, and Lorien Revealed. Lorien Revealed gets a special place in this mention here. It's not a creature, but it's actually recursive on itself. You can cycle this away, get this Six Sanctuary, and put it back on top if you wanted to. Probably not the move, but it's castable out of the hand. You know, five mana draw three is perfectly reasonable. Um, all these island cyclers are instant speed, uncounterable tutors for Mystic Sanctuary. If you're a Tatiova player, you want to play every single one of those island cyclers because they dramatically increase the reliability of your, of your combo, um, and they also just find your lands. The other thing, too, is that these are just creatures. Um, Tidal Terror is a 6-mana 5-6 that becomes unblockable. This will end games, and this is what I'm talking about with these Tatiova builds where, you know, maybe you lean out of the combo, um, and you maybe you, you tuck it away as something that you can get, but it's mainly just a creature beats kind of a thing. Tidal Terror allows you to do that. Uh, Striped Riverwinder, six mana, five, five flying, or sorry, Hexproof, that is one mana to draw a card. And that's really, that's a really good floor. Like on the baseline, you have this in your opening hand, you just cycle it away to get another card. Uh, Shoreline Ranger is an iconic uh, tutor effect while also being this weird card that if all the combo cards are exiled out of your deck, you can just kill people with this flying 3-4. Um, if you've played a lot of limited, you know that it's pretty like it's a pretty common thing to like end the game with a three power flyer um, that's like overcosted because it's evasion. It's it's a great spell. So um, moving on from there, we have black. Now black is another color that's self-contained here. If you just have a black deck, you can run all of these cards and all of the recursion and you're good to go. Um, so Troll of Khazad Doom, look at this thing, six mana, six five with Menace Plus, like absolutely cracked. It finds a land for one mana. You have Gloomfang Mauler, which is really a seven power menacing creature. Um, you know, it's just on par with Troll of Khazad Doom, except that you can actually buff up your other creatures with backup and grant them evasion. This card is nuts. Uh, you know, there's, there's cir circumstances where you just put this on your commander, say a Passageway Seer, and suddenly it's got Menace, and it's, it's terrifying, right? This is a really powerful card here, um, and one that you can reuse over and over again. I've seen this reused in Whisper. If you go and take a look, we're going to have another gameplay video uploaded soon by Clay, where we had somebody playing Whisper Blood Liturgist, and they reused their Gloomfang Mauler three times. It was super, super sick. Definitely a great card. Twisted Abomination, two mana to Swamp Cycle to find that Witch's Cottage or just a Swamp or a Duel. And it's basically a Gurmag Angler that regenerates. Five power regenerator, it's also a zombie. And then you have Horror of the Broken Lands, which is a really cool card in the sense that like, if you were to lean really heavily into this, say like Mr. Orfeo, you could play Horror of the Broken Lands. And if you have 15 creatures that cycle in your deck or 12 creatures that do, there's a really decent chance you could cycle two cards with Horror of the Broken Lands and make it really, really big. Like eight power, six toughness, um, all at instant speed, all uncounterably. And it also cycles for one mana. It just draws a card. Another card you could look into would be Street Wraith, which is a five mana, three, four with Swamp Walk. You can pay two life to cycle that one away too. And then the last one I'll mention is Injector Crocodile, which is um, probably the worst of all of them. However, it's still a Swamp Cycler. And it's a five mana, it's a six mana, five, five, that when it dies, you incubate three. So not likely to die. So the incubate part of it's probably not that useful, but still a good card and still worth playing in these decks. Now we've got red here. We've got Oliphant. 
This thing slaps. Six mana, six, four trample. Whenever it attacks, another creature is going to get evasion and power. Like one mana swamp, like mountain cycling. This is one of the best cards of the entire cycle. This one, Kaza Doom Troll and the blue one are just like insane levels of value. We have Crag Smasher Yeti. Uh, this one's going to back up too, as well as granting trample. Um, its body is a little bit less to be desired, but I still think this is completely playable. This is a great card in Mr. Orfeo. Um, Quakefoot Cyclops actually goes in here too. Um, this card gets a mention because you actually get an uncounterable ability on the Quakefoot Cyclops, um, which allows you to make it so the creature can't block while drawing a card. So this is essentially Renegade Tactics, but it's uncounterable and it's instant speed. Um, and if you reanimate this, the ETB is going to make you make two things not block. So I have Quakefoot Cyclops in Shadowfax, and I've had turns where I cycle away shadow, uh, the Cyclops, something can't block, and then I reanimate it, and two other things can't block, and then you just, you go to town. Uh, Lava Serpent, I put in here as well. It's not a mountain cycler, but it just draws a card. And sometimes when you're in red, you're going to want to draw a card, not necessarily a land. So I put Lava Serpent in here instead of the other mountain cycler, which is the uh, new Furnace Host. I think all of them are playable, though. You can check those out. Um, so yeah, all these are great, uh, great cards to play. You can find that Dwarven Mine with it. Next and the last is going to be green, where we have Greater Sandworm. This is a card I've been playing with for years in reanimator decks, uh, where you could cycle it away into the graveyard and then reanimate it with Exhum, uh, potentially on turn one. Uh, we also have Croson Tusker, which is probably like one of the better cycling creatures in this whole thing, because this card is more value than any of the cards we've talked about so far in terms of being able to generate like loops out of this thing. It's a 6-5 for 7, but when you cycle it for 3, you're going to not only draw a card, but you're going to get a basic land card and put it into your hand. So if you cycle this away, put it into the graveyard, get a land and a card, and you bring it back, that's like three orders of, of value that you can add to your game plan. And it, it's amazing. Uh, Generous Ent and Timberland Ancient, these are really big creatures, super resilient. They both have reach. Uh, there's a little bit of ETV value on Generous Ent, and they both find uh, either a dual land or they find Gingerbread Cabin. So great cards, definitely worth considering here as well. And uh, yeah, so that's the concept. Let's apply it. We have a couple of comments. Mizu says, I'm not sure if you talked about red being able to discard via Bitter Reunion or Thrill of Possibility and then recurring it with white or black effects. I think you said it all there. Um, I don't need to add much to that. That's a, that's a great point because all of these creatures can also be fodder to be discarded with either blood tokens or in, you know in some sort of looting or rummaging effect and you don't care because you can get it back later on so i think that's a great point it it really adds a lot of validity to cards like um like famished gorger which i'll put up on screen here we weren't gonna i don't think we're gonna play it um in this deck famished forager sorry um this is a four mana uh four three vampire if it enters the battlefield and your opponent lost life this turn you're gonna uh, gain three red mana and you have the ability to pay three to uh, basically to rummage. Um, and this is, a, this is a very aggressive card, pretty cool. Um, definitely the kind of card that if you have these cycling cards and all you want is more cards, this is one way that you could do it. But yeah, Bitter Reunion, another way you could do it too. A uh, Dranus Stinger, Alex says. So Dranus Stinger is a, a, red, a, a red cycling payoff. It's part of the Cycle Storm combo in 60 card popper. Uh, you can cycle it for one. And whenever you cycle a card, you can ping everybody for one too. So um, definitely an option you could do here. I mean, there's, you know, this actually could be like a pinger in a deck that plays a lot of cycling cards. So you could actually use this as part of a curiosity combo. You put Tandem Lookout into play, Soul Bond it to this, or you play uh, the Ophidian Eye on this thing and then you cycle cards and um, that's a way you could do it as well. Uh, probably not for this deck, but definitely a cool card regardless. So let's talk about uh, Cardur and what we're gonna play here. So let's start with the meat of this thing so I can show you what it looks like because the final piece of it is that you play the sacrifice cards like Village Rites, 
um, costly plunder, deadly dispute, reckoner's bargain, corrupted conviction, and nasty end. All these cards work great here too. So let's start by getting the cyclers. We're gonna go O uh, cycling. Uh, yep, sorry, O cycling uh, type creature. Okay, so we're gonna put Crag Smasher Yeti. Uh, we could look into playing the Desert Ceridon as well. It is just one mana draw card. Um, could try that. The Furnace Horse uh, Host Charger is gonna be great here too. Just a six mana five five haste is gonna be great for taking the initiative, taking the Monarch, uh, punishing somebody who doesn't have very many blockers. We're gonna play the Gloomfang Mauler. We're gonna play the Horror of the Broken Lands. Uh, we could play the Injector Crocodile. I think this is going to be good here too. The Lava Serpent. The Oliphant's going to be amazing. Uh, Quakefoot Cyclops, we could play too. Uh, Street Wraith, we're going to have a little bit of extra life to play with because Cardor gains us life when things die in combat. So I think that this is okay and reasonable too. And then Troll of Khazad Doom, Twisted Abomination, and that is that. Okay, so we've got our package of creatures. This is probably more than we're going to end up with. I don't think we're necessarily going to stick around with, with all of these creatures. Uh, let's see, narrowing that chat down there. But we're going to start with that. And then let's do uh, Blood Fountain. We're going to do Reaping the Graves. And, and honestly, like, you know, Black has good card draw in a couple of cards. You know, we've got um, the, the, the sacrifice cards that can turn a creature into more cards. We have the, um, you know, Knight's Whisper, Sign and Blood, Read the Bones, Pointed Discussion, um, those cards. We have Siphon Mind at the high end. But after that, you start to get a little bit slim and all of these cards lose you life, except for the sacrifice ones. So Reaping the Graves, like regularly, if I had to guess, is going to easily be a, a three mana draw three at instant speed. Um, you know, all we have to do is a, an opponent casts a spell, another opponent counters it, they counter it back, we cast ours, that's a draw four. And that's really strong. So this card is gonna be fantastic in the deck. I think we're also gonna play Wander in Death. I've been really imp uh, you know, impressed by this card. So let's do, uh, this is gonna be draw, it's also gonna be recursion. And same here, we're gonna drop this in uh, recursion. This is also gonna be draw, this is gonna be recursion right here. Um, of these here, we're gonna have Horror of the Broken Lands is gonna be, uh, let's see, creatures. And let's do um, hashtag 5MV. I actually do want to start organizing my decks around mana values uh, more these days. Uh, because I think it's a really uh, important way to measure kind of like, okay, you know, what, what, you know, what does my curve look like? So let's do that. Um, this one right here is going to be hashtag 6MV. And the Desert Ceridon um, also, this is also going to be a draw effect. Furnace Host Charger is going to be in the 6 mana value, 6 mana value. Lava Serpent, six mana value, but also draw. Oliphant is gonna be uh, six. You can see this curve is a little expensive here, but it's a little deceptive because in reality, like these cards are, we're casting them for one and for two, and then we're casting them for a lot. And this represents kind of the top end of our deck. So we've got this package here. Let's also make sure we have Witch's Cottage and that we have, um, Mortuary Mire, and that we have Haunted Fengraf, like that, and these cards are all recursion, while also being, uh, these are going to be hashtag, uh, uh, what is it, we'll just do hashtag lands, I guess, this will make things a little bit annoying because we'll have to move things over one by one, but that's okay, uh, we've got those. Okay, so that's a solid start here. We've got three of those. What are some of the other ones that we put in our uh, in our list here? We also had Unsealed and Acropolis, um, which we could totally play too. I really like this card. Um, you know, it's, it's going to give us more options from the graveyard. It's gonna fill it up. 
Um, okay, now let's just get into some good black stuff. We've got Vicious Battle Rager, because really one of the most powerful things you can do with Carter Doom Scourge is to, um, is to basically lock down uh, the initiative of the Monarch because people are goaded. We haven't really talked about the Commander. You've all probably read it so far. And that is when it enters the battlefield, all the creatures in play are goaded. Um, and whenever an attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one and you gain one. Uh, so the goading is huge. Everybody's going to be hitting each other. We're going to be building up. We're going to secure the Monarch and the initiative, and we're going to ride that shit straight to victory. That's another thing I should mention is that when we up the creature count by playing all these like modal spells that tutor, that kind of read like tutor a land or draw a card uncounterably, that means our creature density is going to be insane. We're going to have like guaranteed like three to five options when we flip Throne of the Dead Three. So if you think about initiative, the ability to flip with Throne of the Dead Three, you know, one of these massive creatures into play is insane. Like imagine you flip, um, imagine you flip, say, uh, you know, Horror of the Broken Lands. Like there's even, you know, worlds where you, uh, we're going to play the Grave Flicker effects too. So like imagine somebody goes to kill your Vicious Battle Rager or you're in combat uh, you can undying evil that creature and it'll come back into play and say you complete the throne of the dead three you're gonna have all of these incredible creatures to choose from with that effect uh which is great we've got aria car uh car back we're just gonna go with aria because i think i'm gonna mispronounce that name but aria welcome to the stream glad to have you here uh, you got Dark Ritual and Cabal Ritual in there. I don't think we're going to be playing Cabal Ritual. Dark Ritual is a possibility. Although, in all honesty, um, the only thing with Dark Ritual is that uh, Dark Ritual, like tutor, like like turboing out Cardur, isn't that good. Uh, Cardur wants there to be lots of stuff in play so that you make everybody hit each other, and turboing it out isn't that useful. I would like Dark Ritual more if we had a built-in way in our deck to uh, loot that card away when we don't want it anymore. So if we top deck it in the late game, it's an awful top deck. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll consider it. If there's a good way to, to get rid of it, like with lots of blood tokens, then that might be good too. Um, we're actually, speaking of blood tokens, we're gonna go, let's do O blood. And Mizu says, I didn't think about their strength as uh, Throne of the Dead Three targets. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing you have to keep in mind is like, these cards absolutely end the game if you flip them off Throne of the Dead Three. Like, think about um, like troll the, the troll. If you flip that into play, it is a nine eight, basically unblockable. It's going to be the triple abyss. It's crazy. It's so so strong. So Mizu says also um, I do like it for getting out early initiative or monarchy. I think that's the one reason that we might play it is that early builds of this, of Passageway Seer that Nate Diggity worked on, uh, basically had like the, the Dark Ritual in there and it wasn't for Cardur, it was for other cards in the deck that produce like, uh, you know, just unassailable amounts of value. If you go turn two Thor to the Black Rose or turn two Vicious Battle Rager, it's, it basically makes up for itself in terms of the lost card. So you lose a card, but you're going to get a lot of cards back from it. And when you gain those things early, it's quite early, you know, it, it can be quite game ending. So Arya says, what about mana rocks? We're definitely going to play mana rocks. We definitely want to hit Cardur, have the ability to cast and recast Cardur over and over and over again. Um, Golden Leaf says, I'm a fan of, fan of Songs of the Damned with the amount of creatures you have as a late game way to out, allow us to do multiple beaters. We could consider that. Um, if we get to the end and it looks like we're building completely around these cycling creatures, I'm open to considering it. Um, you know, Songs of the Damned also is phenomenal for end, for creating like an end, uh, a game ending um, Crypt Rats or Pestilence uh, mm -hmm. situation. So definitely something I'm open to considering. Um, you know, if we've got lots to do with our mana. Yeah, for sure. Something like Belligerent Guest can go in here because basically what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to turn any of those cycling creatures into one mana draw one if, they, if we don't want the lands. So if we don't want the lands and what we need is action, something like Belligerent Guest could be really good for that. Also Belligerent Guest with the Throne of the Dead Three, with the Gloomfang Mauler, with the, um, the Crag Smasher Yeti, being able to buff up the power on this is quite good. 
Um, Bloodfell Caves, we will be playing. Something like Bloodfire and Fusion is another card we could play here too. This is a great sweeper. We could put this on Cardur and basically say like, yeah, like kill my commander. You basically just get to hold on to this. It's also tutorable, uh, which is great. It's protection from aura-based removal. Um, definitely something we could consider. This one will probably be on the chopping block if there's better stuff. Uh, Arias is undying and undying cantrips like supernatural stamina. Yep, we'll be playing some of those as well. Definitely um, on, on our game plan here. Okay. There's actually like madness things here to do as well, which is kind of interesting, but I, I don't think that's what we're gonna build around. I think that's too, too cute. Um, we don't need to be doing that. Uh, what I'm really looking for is anything that creates a blood token. Bloody Betrayal is gonna be probably pretty damn good in this deck because we're gonna play all of the sacrifice effects um, to be able to make sure that we can, you know, sacrifice Cardur in case somebody kills it um, or sacrifice it if they try to put an aura on it or if somebody tries to kill one of our big creatures, we sack it instead. And so Bloody Betrayal will be take control of somebody's creature, hit them with it, sacrifice it, and then we have a blood token afterwards, um, which is great. So those are good. Um, something like Creeping Bloodsucker is interesting, although to be honest, I'm, I, I haven't been hugely impressed with this card. Falconrath Celebrants is another, you know, one of my favorite red cards in the format right now because it's two blood tokens on a 4-4 four, four Menace. It's very good. What uh, what creature type is Cardur? He's a demon berserker. Okay, so that won't work with with uh, the, the Malakir Blood Priest. Pointed discussion, creating a blood token is great, um, and that is all looking pretty good there. I don't think we're going to find anything else. Yeah, I don't think we're going to play Voldar and Epicure. It's just too low impact. Um, so yeah, there's a good start there. Uh, we have the uh, Vicious Battle Rager. Let's also make sure we have the Underdark uh, Explorer. Uh, we're also going to go and get the... Oh, this is actually 5 mana value. And it's also draw because it does draw us cards. Uh, we're going to play the Thorn of the Black Rose. And this one is going to be under draw. It's also going to be under 4 mana value. Uh, we're going to want Chain, uh, let's see, we're going to want Chain Devil. And we're also going to want Fleshbag Marauder. Um, I would say that these cards have gotten a little bit worse since the meta has, has really begun to mature uh, because there's a lot of decks that are going really wide. I think you should still have them in your decks because you need ways to deal with things that can't be targeted. And, uh, and being able to orchestrate a scenario where they only have one creature in play is still good. Um, but yeah, like Gretchen, you know, usually has Gretchen in play. So you're not usually hitting their key things, which are their untappers with these. Um, they're happy to sack their Gretchen. If they make infinite mana, they cast Gretchen infinite times. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but, uh, but, you know, things like Sailor's Bane, uh, things like a creature with protection on them, anything with Shroud or Hexproof, a Crackling Drake, uh, these are important cards, and you flip them into play off Throne of the Dead 3, which is a way to cheat removal into play. So these ones here are, are definitely good. We'll do 3 uh, three MV, and we're also going to, let's see, find 3 MV. We're also going to do Edicts, because we want to know how many of those we have in the deck. Uh, we're going to do Chain Devil under Edicts. We're going to do Chain Devil under 4. We're going to do this one under 5. Falconrath Celebrants is also a form of card draw. Uh, yep, in there. Belligerent Guest, also a form of card draw. Uh, let's see, this is also going to be under 3MV. Uh, this right here, if we do play it, will be under Sweepers. Okay, point to discussion. This is going to go under Draw. This one right here is going to be kind of like removal... Um, and draw in a sense because that's really what it's going to be there for it's a threaten effect um but we'll, we'll get back to that uh this one here life there we've got 20 31 cards in the deck uh four of those are lands we're probably going to be a 34 land deck um usually i would play 35 in a deck like this but i think because we have the land tutors we're going to be flush on lands it's not going to be a problem we're going to have 10 mana rocks it's going to be totally fine um, what are some other generically good black stuff? We've got Gray Merchant of Asphodel. Uh, gray with an E. I always get that mixed up. Wait. Is it? 
No, wait. I just spelled the other word wrong. Grey Merchant of Asphodel. This is a finisher. This is one of the better cards that you can flip off of Throne of the Dead 3. I've won a lot of games th flipping this off the initiative. Um, Grey Merchant of Asphodel is another one of these cards where it's like, okay, if we're playing the Grave Flicker effect, Undying Evil, Supernatural Stamina, um, you know, uh, um, Undying Malice, Feign Death, um, Fake Your Own Death, those cards, um, you know, one of the ways that I have been ending games lately is in these black decks, those cards, there's so many good ETBs in black that if your opponent's killing something, either through combat or with a removal spell, and we're reusing it and protecting it, that is like better than, re it's, it's better than protection, right? Because it's coming back in with a counter on it. It's giving you that ETB again. Um, and so a card like Gary, you know, I've had games where I go Undying Evil, and then, and it resolves, and you go Deadly Dispute, and it comes right back into play. You get that other trigger again. There's nothing they can do about it. If they let the Feign Death resolve, any sacrifice effect is going to be uncounterable at that point. Um, so having cards like this is deeply synergistic. Uh, being able to reuse this with our, uh, with our recursion effects like this, also very strong. Um, also, another thing I want you to know is that if you're about to go through Throne of the Dead 3, and you have gray merchant in your graveyard you can use merchant uh witch's cottage or mortuary mire to put gary on top and then you hit somebody to gain the initiative and then you flip gary into play freely uh which is again very game ending so um make sure all these look the same uh oliphant i like this printing a lot but i think we're just going to keep everything looking really clean here uh does this one have another version it doesn't only oliphant does that's too bad um Okay, other hard hitters. Uh, this is going to be like one of the better Pestilence decks in the format. Uh, Crypt Rats, also pretty insane. We're going to have Fiery Cannonade. Now you're going to see like our current curve is pretty high. And so um, we're going to lower that down with unblockable creatures, which will be really good. But these sweepers are going to be really important for basically like like keeping us alive in those early game uh you know maybe like the first couple turns of the game we can like sweep up a you know a gut player although in all honesty i'd rather like not kill the gut player stuff and just make them swing at other people which sounds amazing like if you if you're a gut player and this is at the table i'm sorry but you just got out drafted because this thing is going to absolutely like make you do the like the <laughs> it's going to make you do the devil's work. Like this thing is going to make you swing at other people and then it's going to devour you in the late game. Um, so let's do sweepers here. And we're going to do sweepers. And this pestilence is atrocious. I love the art, but, and, and you know what? Hate me for it, but we're going to use the uh, 30th edition because I love the old border uh, paired with the old art. And you can't get that unless you do beta. And I don't want to inflate the cost of the deck. Actually, this one is seven bucks. I, so on these live streams, I always pick the cheapest cards that have black borders because these are this is a community resource and I want you all to know just how cheap these decks are, right? Like this deck's probably gonna be sub 35, like easy, uh, easily sub 35. Um, so there we go. Um, so we've got these here. Let's also do Arms of Hadar, just in case somebody tries to get frisky with us. Uh, we can basically point this at a gut player and end their career. Um, you know, we might not need this ultimately if we have ways of reusing Cardur enough. Um, so we'll, we'll just keep that in mind. Um, but Arms of Adar is one of the most backbreaking spells in the format right now for, for that particular um, archetype. Um, speaking of four mana spells, uh, if you're not playing Demir Houseguard, you better have a really good reason for it. Because Demir Houseguard is... Uh, an amazing tutor. Um, if we go and find this one here, uh, this card tutors anything that's four mana. That includes Pestilence, Evancar's Justice, Arms of Adar, Eye Blight Massacre, Siphon Mind, Snuff Out, Chain Devil, Slum Reaper, Thorn of the Black Rose, Vicious Battle Rager, Stirring Bard, uh, Trailblazer's Torch. Um, it's like, what, what more could you want? Like, this, this thing is absolutely crazy. Um, it does so much. While it's also just a 2-3 with evasion, uh, fear is basically unblockable in a lot of cases. It's also a sack outlet. So if you play Demir Houseguard and you go feign death on Gary, you sack Gary to this thing, and boom, there you go. Um, so this one's going to be a tutor.
and we're going to create a list here, which is going to be a resource of all the four mana spells that we can use to get things back with this. So uh, we are absolutely playing Oubliette. Great point. We aren't there yet, but we'll add that one just while we're at it. And we'll just do Snuff Out because, you know, we're, we're there and we're thinking about it. Um, this is going to be under Removal. And this right here is going to be under Removal. Uh, the other card that this also hits, and if you're not playing this one, boy, should you. Faceless Butcher. Holy crap. All right, this card is something that it seems like all of CPDH has completely slept on, including me, okay? But it ends today. It ends here. This card is cracked, okay? The, what, what got me to rethink uh, the use of this card is Alabaster Host Intercessor. It's that white card that we were talking about earlier uh, when, we, uh, when we were looking here. Uh, Alabaster Host Intercessor is right here. Uh, this is a 6-mana 3-4 ETB exile a creature until it leaves the battlefield. Well, if you point it at somebody's commander, you are a complete psychopath if you let your commander stay under this commander. Because if you do that with me, I may actually, like, counterspell. Like, like other people may counterspell the removal spell you try to use on this to get it back so that your commander stays there. Like 85, 90% of the time, it's fully correct to take this thing and put it straight in your command zone, which means that this is a six mana exile effect on a three, four. It's a, it's a banisher priest on a big body. And so when we're looking at, at Faceless Butcher, this is even better. It's, it's four mana. It's a four mana creature. It's a two, three. It's four mana for Demir Houseguard. Uh, with Grave Flicker effects, we can play this, and then on the stack, Grave Flicker it, sacrifice it, and get two creatures while keeping our body. I mean, it's just, this card is nuts. Like, definitely play this card in your deck. Um, it, it's just one of, the, one of the more underplayed cards in the format right now. It's also great off Throne of the Dead 3, because you flip it into play, and it's a 5-6. It's, it's just a 5-6, and it has Hexproof, so they can't even get it back with a removal spell if they want. Like most of the time, the reasonable thing to do is somebody hits your commander with this and you send it to the command zone, which means that this bottom part of text right here, this part, this no longer exists like nine out of 10 times. So yeah. Okay. We're doing real good here. Um, okay. Good black stuff. Uh, we're also going to want just classics like sign in blood we're going to want Knight's Whisper. You know, black sometimes can have trouble with, you know, taking a lot of damage off of these spells. But in this deck, it's not going to be an issue. Um, so definitely good to play those. Um, probably play Read the Bones too. Um, probably play that as well. Although there could be an argument for us just, you know, uh, oh, we don't actually have it, but Horror of the Broken Lands. Where is it? Where is she? Oh, we have it here. Uh, do we also have this under 5 MV? Yeah, we do. Okay, good. Uh, oh, these are not the draw effects. These are. Okay. Um, cool. So we got those. We've got our Edicts. We're also going to play Vraska's Fall. Um, because, um, because Vraska's Fall is instant speed. I've, I've been really happy with this card so far. It's saved my bacon on a number of occasions. We can't flip it into play off Throne of the Dead 3, but it's instant speed, so I think that's good enough. We're going to play Scred. Let's go into the removal. We're going to play Victim of Night. We're going to play Grasp of Darkness. You can see I've done a little bit of uh, building around black before. This stuff is like second nature to me now. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Ghastly Demise is looking pretty good right now, too, because of all the cycling we're doing. Um, it is non-black, which is a little bit scary. But, you know, black stuff usually isn't the combo. It's usually like mid-range or aggro. Um, we're going to do Executioner's Capsule as well. Um, I think this card is really good right now, in particular in the meta because it's just an onboard piece of removal. Angela says, Vraska's Fall is one of her new favorite cards. Yeah, Vraska's Fall is great. Um, I mean, the poison counter basically doesn't matter at all, um, but instant speed sack a creature is great. Yeah, very playable, very good. 
uh, Victim of Night, Grasp of Darkness. You always got to make sure, though, this Grasp of Darkness art is atrocious. You always play the Scars of Muradin art because this shit's metal. Uh, take a look at this. Look at this angel just getting absolutely throttled by the forces of evil, which is hype. So, yeah. You can tell I'm, I'm, I'm a black mage through and through here. Um, this, is, this is my jam. Um... I kind of like Ghastly Demise. It, it might be a little bit too much of the of the black. I think we're going to play Ashes to Ashes as well. Uh, because, you know, combat damage isn't going to be something that reaches us very often. Uh, this is a really good card. Uh, this is another card in mono black that it's just so good. Um, exile two non-artifact creatures. It deals five damage to you. It's a two for one for three mana. I, I really think it's, it's very playable. Um, it's not instant speed, but that's okay. Um, what are some other two CMC stuff we could play? Oh, Terminate. <laughs> Terminate's great. Um, we're also going to play Echoing Decay. Echoing Decay is a card that has been kind of in obscurity for a long time. It's really good now. Uh, Third Path Iconoclast makes tons of tokens. Gut makes tons of tokens. It kills gut as well as killing all of the tokens if gut is dead. So if you kill gut, the gut, the tokens become small, and then you kill them all with Echoing Decay. The other thing, too, is that the tokens are the same name as the initiative skeleton. It's the same creature because they came from the same set. So Echoing Decay might hit more than just your opponent, your, your gut player's thing. It might hit other people's stuff, too. There's also um, the fact that it kills basically every combo creature that we care about, except for Pneumotic Wall and Peregrine Drake. Most other stuff, it, it, it dies. Um, Echoing Decay also hits um, Abdel tokens. That's the other thing. So uh, great card. Definitely play it. It's very playable right now. Um, Echoing Decay is also a sweeper. Okay, Ghastly Demise under removal. We're going to be revisiting this one because, look, we're in Rakdos. We can play uh, Lightning Bolt. And we're going to probably play... You know, we're not going to have that many artifacts, so I don't know if Galvanic Blast makes the cut. Um, yeah, actually, a Ghastly Demise might not make it. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, what are some other... Uh, let's do ID Rakdos. Oh, that's already part of the... Okay. So type um, type instant O destroy O creature. Let's say... Let's see what we get for creature. We could play cards like Death Rattle. Um, a Braid is actually a card that we'll play here. I really like that. Blood Frenzy is great here too. Uh, Blood Frenzy is a super cool red spell. It's going to give a, an attacking or blocking creature a big power buff. And then it's going to destroy it at the end step. Um, there's ways that we can use this with our creatures and Undying Evil. So you like swing in, you take your unblocked ETB creature and you Blood Frenzy it. And then it hits for more damage. You go Undying Evil on it. It, sat, it destroys. It comes back into play. But even better than that is that we put this on our opponent's creatures. Somebody swings with a Dargo, you make it lethal with a Blood Frenzy. Opponents like, ah, hell no, and they kill their creature. That means that your one spell was a two for one. You got a removal out of their spell, uh, removal or a counter spell out of their hand. And then maybe if it's removal, then they killed the creature as well. Uh, so Blood Frenzy is definitely going to be in here. Uh, Mizu says, go for the throat, Doom Blade, cast down, and a braid. Yep, absolutely. Cast down's here. Definitely great recommendations. Um, yeah, we'll get to those in a second. Uh, Death Rattle is really good. We fill our graveyard a lot. The fact that it doesn't kill green creatures is kind of a big deal. Not being able to kill a black creature, not as big a deal. Not being able to kill a green creature means dying to a combo. So this is a great card. We actually fill the graveyard really well, but ultimately I think we're just not going to be able to play it for that reason. Um, if we do have enough removal where we can still play this, then I think it's, it's pretty damn good. Um, so we'll put this one in the sideboard for something we can think about. The other thing is that even though we're filling our graveyard really quickly, I don't know that we want to, we don't want to exile that stuff. If, you know, like that's not, um, we want to reuse that stuff later on. So I, I actually think it's probably not going to make the cut. Um, oh, I forgot. There's a couple of other cards we're going to play here. Uh, so we've got Go for the Throat, of course. Um,
It was actually, um, yeah, Wrecking Ball. This is what I was looking for. Wrecking Ball is a super cool card. It's tutorable with Demir Houseguard and it's instant speed land destruction. So your uh, Gretchen Menace at your, uh, you know, at your LGS or on, you know, Moxfield and Discord, you know, goes to combo off, they tap out, you Wrecking Ball their land and you completely ruin all the work they did. Uh, this card is really good and it's modal, you know, you can still kill creatures with it. So it's, it's a great spell. Um, you know, we could think about you're already dead and, um, and uh, the uh, other one, Mirrodin Avenged, uh, because we do have a lot of sweepers. And these cards are generally pretty good. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, so let's see. Do, go for the Throat, Doomblade, Cast Down a Braid. Yep. No, not Land Destruction. Yeah, there's another one actually called Befoul. If you're only in Mono Black, Befoul is where you want to be. Um, this is Sorcery Speed. It can't be regenerated. And it's a non-Black creature but it's still worth playing in black. Like you should, you should come prepared with this sort of land destruction. All right, the mask is coming off. <laughs> I think I held out long enough to uh, make the point um, with, the, uh, with the, the demon mask. God, talking is such thirsty work. Okay, so Wrecking Ball, Go for the Throat, Doom Blade, Cast Down. This is like more removal than we need. What's the other one that destroys, um, you know, our, I, I'm actually, this isn't to say that you should, um, that you should run a braid in your red decks always, because I think that there's this mistake of thinking that it's like your problem. Um, if you're in a really aggressive red deck, playing a braid is a bit of a mistake, I think, because you're kind of leaning on the Rakdos players and the blue players with like Boomer, you know, with, with other forms of removal, maybe a green player, just anybody other than you to deal with cards like the Abdel, you know, ETB uh, rocks that end the game, like Hierophant's Chalice or, um, you know, Meteorite or um, there's a couple of other ones that can end the game with too. There's other cards as well, um, like Energy re energy Refractor um, that basically allow you to fix your mana in a first day of class combo. But generally speaking, an Abrade is going to be pointed at a, um, is going to be a, at a Cranial Plating, at a Whisper Silk Cloak, a Neurox Stealth Suit. We are a mid-range deck. It is our job. We want that flexibility to be able to disrupt with that, um, with that tech. <laughs> Okay. Oh, another play card we're going to play is Thunderclap as well. So we're going to have to actually choose with our removal what we want to play. We could actually play um, Ingot Chewer. That's an interesting thought because this is another card that we can get back over and over again. So being able to, like in a deck like this where we have all of this recursion, being able to attach our spells to creatures or our effects to creature spells is really good because this is one mana evoke. Um, we, we can kill something. It's not instant speed, um, but we can get it back. And it's just a three, three. We can flip it into playoff throne to the dead three. There's a lot to like about it. Um, there's also another one of those that I'm looking for here. Oh, wow. Huh? It's interesting. Shenanigans, no. Shredded sails, no, although it does cycle. So we'll throw this in one in the sideboard. We're not gonna have room for this probably. We could also play something like Smash to Dust if we want to have the ability to destroy an artifact as well as sweep the board. Um, you know, paired with things like the, you know, the uh, Mirrodin Avenged or You're Already Dead. Oh my God, I gotta listen to that BFG song again. Hold on one sec, I'm on. I'm on liquid drum and bass right now, but uh, whew, I just gotta, gotta keep that energy up here with uh, that BFG Division song. Good Lord, that shit slaps. If you didn't hear this at the beginning of the stream, you, you I, I will say you missed out, but you're not gonna miss out anymore because I'm dropping the link in there. This is like one of my favorite songs of all time. <laughs> and actually, if you haven't played it, I just want a side note. Doom Eternal is one of the finest first person shooter games I've ever played in my life. 
Um, you might not know it, but I actually used to play. Um, I used to be a competitive. I used to be a competitive gamer. Um, you know, when I was like 16, um, I was on a, a team called K KCS uh, for Halo in Halo 2, Halo 3. I wasn't able to compete because I wasn't uh, of age to play the game at a competitive level. Uh, but in scrims, I was really nasty. Like my time playing Halo, I, you know, was probably like very, very close to the maybe top like 500 players in the world or something like that. Um, for Halo 2, 3, Reach. Um, uh, and then Halo 4, I actually competed in a tournament in Sweden where I placed second, and I hadn't even played Halo 4 at the time. Um, so uh, when I say that Doom is like one of the best first-person shooters of all time, I mean it. it. It really rewards you and incentivizes you and forces you to play super, super aggressively. Um, and, it, and it's a really like, whew, that, that game will get your blood pumping. So uh, definitely go check that out. It's pretty inexpensive. There's a lot of great, um, a lot of great expansions for it, and the storyline is actually really cool too. So uh, Alex says I played a god awful amount of CS:GO. Yeah, CS:GO is another one of those games, just like insanely high skill cap. Um, we could actually something play a card like Terror. Um, there's a lot of regenerate effects in the format right now. Um, it doesn't kill artifacts, but that's not such a big deal. Non-black is, is kind of a big deal. Um, but the one in a black makes this easier to splash. The only thing, though, is that with all these cycling cards, our mana is going to be perfect. So this probably won't make the cut. Um, Twisted Embrace is a really cool card uh, because this is a tutorable aura to kill things. This card is better when... This card is, like, at its best in um, in uh, Killian because it's a tutorable way uh, to get removal for a deck that wants auras. So um, we could consider this, um, but yeah, sorcery speed, so. Okay, cool. So we've got that. Okay. So what do we have here? We have all this removal. We also want Thunderclap. Oh, you know what we could play too is Spinning Darkness. Uh, Spinager. Spinning Darkness. Uh, this is a card that, um, you know, I don't know that we want to be exiling our graveyard for any reason at all, like to be quite honest. Like I think that this card kind of works against a lot of what we are trying to do in this deck, which is we want to have cards that we can cycle early at no cost and then bring them back later on. Um, often uncounterably, either with lands, reaping the grave, something like that. Spinning Darkness is going to be the top three cards of your, of your graveyard, so you have to pay attention to orders matter on your on your graveyard. But this is a free Lightning Helix. Like, free Lightning Helix. This card is, like, dramatically underplayed. Um, that said, I think our removal is going to be good enough, and the removal is, like, we're going to be so overloaded on it because the only things we're going to need to kill are stuff that you know, is mainly combo because we're going to make everybody else kill each other. And um, so I, I just think this is going to be sideboard for now. Thunderclap is going to be main board. We might not end up playing Bloody Betrayal. I think we're going to cut that. Uh, 19 removal spells, five sweepers. This is starting to look like a control deck, right? Maybe maybe this is actually, um, you know, maybe when we say reactive midrange, this is actually just control. Um, yeah, this is control. Like, we're going to be able to keep most of this stuff. Look, we have 24 creatures. You know, we're going to have to put lands in, so we're, we're actually getting pretty close to being at the end um, of our of our uh, allotment. And you can see how fast this build is going right now because um, I'm really experienced with this, um, with, this, with this kind of stuff in this format. Okay. Um, I want to check something. God, this song box. I'll turn the volume on this shit. Dude, Mick Gordon, unbelievable. Ugh. God, I need to I need to go see like a tool concert, I can tell. Um Oh, Arden Elementalist is really good in this deck too. We can flip this off Throne of the Dead 3 to get a creature uh, uh instant back or like a removal spell. Uh, but we can also reanimate this over and over again. We're going to play Bajuka Bog for the Graveyard Hate. Um, is there anything else that goes from the battlefield? Um, 
Yeah. So Alex, you, you hit a great point here. Uh, shiny impetus is definitely a card we're going to play. We may play parasitic impetus. The only thing I, I like that we're going to have a backup for goad with those cards because, um, you know, it might be that Cardur becomes like a source of targeting for counter spells. Um, we're also going to play Pyroblast and Reb in this deck, both of them. And but Shiny Impetus is better than Parasitic because it's Parasitic is the only card in that cycle that actually harms the player who you put it on. Um, all the other ones, it buffs up their creature. They can't attack you, and it generates us repeat value. Whereas the Parasitic Impetus, they might end up actually killing their own creature because they're going to attack, they're going to gain us life, and they're going to lose life themselves, which they might not be able to hang with. Um, it's still probably just perfectly good enough um, in a deck that actually applies a lot of damage outside of the combat step through our commander. Oh, you know what we could play? Holy shit. Dragon Shadow and Dragon Breath. With all of these creatures coming into play, these will auto-attach for unblockable, basically, and haste and fire breathing. You imagine we put like a Crag Smasher Yeti into play. We put the counters on the Yeti. We can immediately attach this to it. Let's just, for the memes, let's just see what that looks like. We're, we're getting to the end of our allotment, so we're probably not going to be able to play these, but I, I am quite curious about it. Exhum... I don't know about this card. I think that this brings back too many good things from our opponents, so we're, we're not going to play this. Especially because I think we bring back our thing, like, kind of first, in a sense. If somebody can clarify that for me, like, what's the order in which the creatures come in? Because if we get it first, that means other people gaining the initiative of the monarch. Well, other people gaining the initiative are actually going to get the initiative in the end, and we want the initiative. Um, even though our stuff is better than theirs, I just don't know if this is uh, something we can afford to play in this format. We could also like inadvertently like give somebody back their combo card and they could just win the game on the spot. Um, this is kind of, uh, no. Summon Undead is another one that we could play for sure. Um, I don't know if that one is going to make the cut. It could. Omen of the Dead is also really good. Instant speed, one mana, it can scry later on. This is kind of crazy. X damage to target creature or a planeswalker where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Wow. Um, it's so expensive, but I love bodies that have removal on them. So let's uh, put this in the sideboard for now. Revolutionist is going to be really good here too because there will be ways to madness it, but mainly it's just a, another um, Archaeomancer. Rise again. Yeah. Oh God, the song. Oh. Oh. Jesus. It's just relentless. We're not gonna have anything for Unearth uh, that we care about. Um. We could actually play creatures that get these back too. So what if we did... Uh... So something like Cadaver Imp. Cadaver Imp's actually a pretty cool one. The fact that it has flying is really good. Um, so this carries like a cranial plating really well. Um, I don't know if cranial plating is gonna be necessary for this deck. I find that that card in control decks is a little bit awkward. The The thing is, is, and that's mainly because we can't swing out without opening ourselves up. And so cranial plating too often is kind of like dead. It's kind of just there. Um, whereas like in this deck, if we goad everybody, we can swing freely and nobody's going to be able to hit us unless they get haste. Um, they like play a creature with haste. Um, and so a card like this could just crack in at people. The other thing is that be because people are like tapped they're going to be tapping all their creatures, either, you know, tapping it to like put a land into play with a scout or tapping it with an untapper to, um, to make sure they don't have to attack if they're a combo player. Um, but there, we just, we might not need evasion that much because they're going to be tapped out. Sanitarium skeleton could be a repeat sack creature. 
Um, we have a cycle of four of these now. We have Sanitarium Skeleton, Clay Revenant, um, the new um, the new black one. I'm forgetting the name. It's like um, Haunt, Haunt of the Dead Marshes, I think is what it's called. And these could just be like early drops that block um, as well as ways to like break parity on our blood tokens because we can play them, we can discard them, we can bring them back. Um, they feel great to discard because they're free. Um, Courier Bat is another version of Cadaver Imp that only requires that you've gained life this turn, which uh, might not actually be all that consistent in this deck. I'm a big fan of these cards as well. Uh, the ability to exile things from people's graveyard on an ETB that we can flip into play off Throne of the Dead 3 uh, that also drains people or makes 2-2 black zombies when you do is good. But I think what we need right now is actually cheaper creatures to fill our curve out. And specifically, not just cheap creatures, but unblockable creatures. Um, so we'll throw these ones in the sideboard just because I, I want to keep them in mind. Ghoul Razors only zombies. Yeah, Haunt of the Dead Marshes. This one will go in sideboard. Grave Scrabbler could also be good here um, because it's basically. Oh, if its madness cost was paid, that's not going to be consistent enough. We could just play Grave Digger, uh, but you know. This is kind of interesting. I don't really want to exile creatures. I want to exile other stuff. Shambling Gas. Shambling Gas isn't going to make the cut just because it just doesn't do enough. Um, I like the card, but I want that card in a deck where I go full out on that. So playing like Festering Mummy, Festering Goblin. Um, there's like six of them, I want to say, that, that do that. Um, there's also Warren Pilferers, which in some ways is actually like better then the other, you know, it's like better than the other um, the other ones because it's actually a 3-3, three, three, which I, I think is more relevant than a 2-2 two, two or a 1-1. One, one. If it's a 2-2 two, two flying or a 1-1 one, one flying, that's a different story, but 3-3 three, three on the ground is going to be what we want. Here, one sec. I don't know about you all, but my allergies are really starting to flare up right now. So, um, yeah. There's Scare Tiller too, which is kind of interesting because what we can do with Scare Tiller is we can uh, cycle a land before we go to combat, put it in our, uh, our cycle a creature that has uh, the land cycling on it. And then when we get that land, we get to put it into play right away, um, which is kind of, that's kind of exciting. Maybe this is another Scare Tiller deck. It's also just a 1-4. Um, I, I think this is a cool source of card advantage potentially for the deck. Um, this also allows us to reuse like ever, you know, Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, um, Forgotten Caves, um, you know, any sort of land that's going to, you know, be sacrificed. Uh, even, you know, Ash Barrens, um, Fen Haunted Fengraf, things like that. It's also a ramp spell, so... Okay, now we are going to be well over our allotment because what we need to do now is go, where are our lands? We have Bajuka Bog. This is going to go into lands. Uh, Bajuka Bog is also going to be graveyard hate. And you can see I'm, I'm stacking tags on these cards because I personally, for one thing, it, just, just as, a, as, a, as an aside... If you ever send me a list and you are looking for feedback, now I, I will say um, I get a lot of lists of people asking for feedback, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually it's quite flattering that you all, um, you know that that you all, you know, want my feedback on these things. Because I have so many of them, I have to turn them down quite often. And so, generally speaking, if it's something I'm giving feedback on, um, what I prefer is that people do it through super chat so that I don't use a bunch of like my time and energy towards something that I could be allocating towards something else. I eventually you just have to put a price on it. Um, but if you do send me something, what I really ask that you do, and I'll, I'll ask this of you if you send it to me, is to put everything in categories. 
because I can't look at a list that is organized based on lands, creatures, sorceries, enchantments, and artifacts. It's literally meaningless to me. It, it, it just, you, you got to organize it in such a way that I can see exactly why you have those cards there. Why are you occupying that slot with that card? And what are the balances of things? Because here, you know, we're looking at like 28 kill spells and sweepers and edicts. And that tells me a lot about the deck. So just as an aside, if you do send something to me, I recommend that you, you do that because I'll probably ask you to do it anyways. Uh, Golden Leaf says, I know this might not be the best, but another goad, Bloodshed Fever. What is that? Whoa. Oh, this, but... Oh, so if we combine... Well, this can attack us too. So it's not actually a goad. Because really the strength of goad in this format is that it's like a kill spell in the sense that that thing, if it's a combat pressure, is not coming at you. It's a fog at the same time. Because it's not coming at you, it's coming at other people, which means they may need to kill it. Um, so this won't, won't play here because goad is already going to make them attack with Cardur. Um, but we should do shiny... Is, is it with an E? Shiny and then Parasitic. I like these cards um, because if Cardur isn't in play, these cards can can do basically Cardur for something that might kill us. Um, so these would go under removal. I don't think they're actually going to make the cut. What's up, Jen? How you doing, dude? Good to have you here. Um, he says, damn, I'm very late. Hey, you're not late. Um, you're, you're right on time whenever you want to come. I always appreciate it when you show up. So um, yeah, you can see kind of what we're going for here. Um, and you'll be able to watch the VOD later on. Was playing some CDH after two months. Yeah, I know you took a break from, from Magic there for a little bit. So uh, I'm just glad that, glad that things are going better, I hope, and, and, that, uh, and that you're able to play a little bit more Magic because um, I know that's, that's important. So um, yeah, so five of these. Let's do 29 Swamp. Let's just do this uh, as a placeholder. Um, we're going to come back and we're, we're going to adjust that later on. I just want to know how many slots we have left. So seven. With all these cards, we actually still have seven cards that we can play in this deck. That's crazy. Uh, six mana value. Um, this is four mana value. And of course, um, these are recursion as well, just of a different sort. Since I'm late, what is the main plan for the deck? That's a great, great, uh, great question. So we can kind of revisit it. So Cardur Doom Scourge, four mana, four, three. When it enters the battlefield, you goad all the creatures in play, which means they can't attack you. They're going to attack everybody else. The other part of it is whenever an attacking creature dies, each opponent's going to lose one life and we're going to gain one life. Um, so this right here, like I should be clear, Cardur Doom Scourge can be built as an aggro deck as a mid-range deck or as a control deck. As an aggro deck, you're just like making everybody hit each other and you're also hitting people. And Cardur is gonna be less of a card that, um, that you like reuse a lot, but it's more of like, it's just pushing damage on people. Um, in a, in a mid-range or a control sense, what Goad is doing is it's allowing us to hoard the initiative and the monarch, um, as well as just attack people who have already tapped. Um, so if we can go two turns in a row, then, uh, you know, then people are tapped out, which is insane. Um, now, the, the deck building paradigm that we're using that you're going to see here is really, really different than most black decks in that the core of our deck is built around creatures that cycle. The reason we're doing that is because, um, and just to look at it, we have like Lava Serpent, Desert Ceradon, Street Wraith, Quakefoot Cyclops, Horror of the Broken Lands, uh, we have um, all of these right here. Gloomfang Mauler, Twisted Abomination, Troll of Khazad Doom, Oliphant, Lava Serpent, Injector Crocodile, Furnace Host Charger, Desert Ceradon, Crag Smasher Yeti. All these cards represent some amount of us getting a land or getting a card, putting it in the graveyard, and then kind of stocking up on it so that we can get it back with F Blood Fountain, Reaping the Graves, Unsealed in Acropolis, Wander in Death, um, even the cards we mill over, we can get with Ardent Elementalist and Revolutionist, which is insane. Um, 
like like this 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 effect is so fucking strong um i think there's even wow there's kind of like ways that we can soft combo with ardent elementalist right if we have like demir house guard in play an ardent elementalist and a um and a feign death effect we can loop that over and over again and if we have a um let's see whenever an attacking creature if we had like a falcon wrath noble or we had an impact tremors we could basically do one damage every for every black mana that we have that's like really interesting uh, but basically that's the idea uh, in my experience in testing, particularly with, with Shadowfax, uh, the new Boros commander, and with Thrall Parasite, I have been like wildly impressed with how good the cycling creatures are. Like I'm fundamentally like I'm not getting dysfunctional hands anymore. It's increased the consistency of my decks by like 10 to 15 percent. And what's amazing is that these cards, they tutor for lands. They help us fix our mana. They find our land drops. And in the late game, look at this, like we don't need win conditions because they're right there. We have 10 huge creatures that just, they just fucking end the game. Like they, these cards are so powerful uh, when you play them late. And so uh, they're, they're, they're so dynamic. We're gonna get more of them. Um, they're, they're modal, they're uncounterable. They feed themselves. Everything about it I love. Everything is amazing. Um, like, like, We'll go on a little tangent here. Let's open up Moxfield and I'll show you an example of how absolutely fucked up this is in Shadow Facts, okay? By the way, bleh, too many. Um, and if you like Boros or if you like Kalia of the Vast in CEDH, this deck is going to just be like a wet dream for you, okay? Um, got a bunch of comments here. Jack says, not sure if Rec Restless Dreams fits the bill for this. We'll take a look at Restless Dreams. If I forget about it, make sure to remind me and we'll come back and check it out. I want to cover Shadow Facts and then we'll come back really quick. Jin Shooting Star says, it's so nice to see that you are enjoying a lot of the cycle cards. Yeah, um, I think it's a new way to think about control and mid-range. And frankly, without coming across as too much of a hot take, most of my control decks are starting to look like mid-range decks that are just really reactive and really slow because they're still packed with creatures. So like all these concerns that people have about, oh, control doesn't work anymore, control is bad, blah, 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 blah. Just all this like nonsense jibber jabber around, you know, what archetypes are good and bad. Like this should put all this to rest. Like a Kaza Doom Troll played on turn 10, you know, on a board that doesn't have a lot of creatures on it anymore, where everybody is low on cards is a great way to end the game. So, um, Jack says, put, uh, but put stuff back in the graveyard and gets a creature back. Okay. We'll definitely check that restless dreams. I'm going to uh, put this in chat so that it's highlighted in yellow so that I can see it later on. Chris says, did they print any new Island cycling cards in the two last sets? You bet your bottom dollar they did. <laughs> and they're both busted. The first one is title terror, which is a six mana, five, six, uh, serpent, uh, octopus horror that you can uh, tap two untapped creatures to give it unblockable it's cycle island cycles for two amazing card uh, you can totally win the game with this card if you stall out in tatiova it's also a great blocker you've tons of mana to cast it um, and then the other one is lorian revealed which is actually the only one that's not a creature it island cycles for one and it's a five mana draw three at sorcery speed completely broken. If there's ever been a question about whether you should be attacking the combo player as a mid-range control or aggro player, that should put it to rest, okay? Tatiova is like, they're literally going to be replacing Expedition Map, one of the best tutors in their deck, with an uncounterable one mana card that they can flip into play with a scout at instant speed. End of turn, they can, fl they can tutor for their Mystic Sanctuary, if they have Tatiova in play, they can scout, put it into play, and they can make infinite blue at end step, bounce everything in play with cap size with mana up, and then they can combo on their next turn. I don't know what else to say. I've been hammering this home. The combo decks are really good in this format. They're winning disproportionate to their meta representation. Um, and uh, if you're an aggro player, you got a job to do. Just saying. So, um, okay. 
Chris Lively says, I love it. Tatiova is my current CDH deck and it's going undefeated right now. Yeah, it's like no surprise to me. Tatiova is like really busted. It's also like in CDH, you're, you're not going to be the scariest thing at the table. And so in a format where everybody's like doing really busted stuff, it might be a little slow for how, you know, fast, like a, a you know, a Rograk deck might be a, you know, like a Silas Rograk or, um, you know, um, a Timnacrom or, or just any of these other like really degenerate CDH decks are. Um, but there is value to being like the second or third scariest person at the table. Um, a lot of value. Um, so Tatiova is super underrated right now. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of hot takes out there. People saying this, that, the other thing, like, this is better. This is bad. This is unplayable. You know, whatever it is, it's like, forget it. Like, there's so much good stuff in this format right now. And um, whatever you want to play, it's probably got a good build of it. Okay, unless you're completely memeing. Let's focus on Shadow Facts for a second. Um, this is another great example of that of that dynamic, okay? We're not in black, we're in white. So we have Breath of Life, False Defeat, Lace to Dinner, and Resurrection. All these reanimation spells. And look at all the cards that we can put in our graveyard. All the cards that we can put into our graveyard for like one to two mana. Sunblade Samurai gets us a Plains, gains us two life. Alabaster Host Intercessor finds a Plains, a Duel. This also finds Idyllic Grange. Idyllic Grange in this deck gives Shadow Facts another power, which means that you can flip four power creatures into play uncounterably for free. Okay, like insane. Um, we have Crag Smasher Yeti also puts power on Shadow Facts uh, with the backup. It's going to give him Trample as well. There's like a non-zero number of games where Shadow Facts is definitely going to deal lethal to people through commander damage. Um, we have Eagles of the North. We can flip this into play for free off of Shadow Facts, just like these two can. Uh, it's going to give plus one, plus O, oh, and first strike to our team while cycling for one for our idyllic range. We have Oliphant, also gives power to Shadow Facts to flip big things into play. Gives Shadow Facts Trample, has Trample itself, like, insane. Like, you can, you can literally go turn one, cycle Oliphant into your graveyard, turn two, Arcane Signet or any two mana rock, turn three, Breath of Life to put Oliphant into play. Like, what the fuck? Like, if you go turn four and everybody's tapped out, you play Shadow Facts. Shadow Facts comes into play with Haste. Oliphant gives it plus two, plus oh, and Trample. And you could literally put a Crimson Fleet Commodore into play, tapped and attacking. On turn four, you would have six, 12, 17 power worth of creatures and the monarch. This is like the sickest Boros deck I've ever built, but hands down, I can't stop. Re I can't stop like running it through its paces. Uh, we have Fault Grinder as well, um, and we have Soul of Migration. So these these cards right here, like powerful form of card advantage in this deck because not only is it cheating things into play, but you already got a land or a card off of it. So there you go. Um, I'm going to post a link to this deck because you you really need to, like, if you're a Boros enjoyer, if you like CEDH, Kali of the Vast, if you like Winota type things, this is a great deck. Um, it also has, like, a ton of really stupid shit you can do, too. Like, we are playing Pyro and Reb. We have Standard Bearer and Soltari and uh, Honor Guard, uh, which basically stop every combo in the format except for First Day of Class and uh, Ghostly Flicker. It stops Tidal Bore, stops Freed from the Reel. It absolutely hoses Seder Enchanter, um, and it protects our Shadow Facts. And then we have Lowland Tracker and Soltari Visionary, which like end the game for anybody who has like combo cards because Soltari Visionary comes in uncounterably. It's a 2-2 two -two first strike. You provoke their untapper, you provoke their combo card, and you kill it over and over again. Um, Soltari Visionary comes in uncounterably, blows up their enchantments. Fault Grinder, it, literally, like, you evoke this, they counter it, and then you go Resurrection to, like, bring it back and destroy their land. Or you flip it into play uncounterably off Shadow Facts if it has one extra power. So, anyways, that's enough of Shadow Facts, but this is a great example of how this paradigm, what I just posted about on Twitter, is so good in this format right now if you're playing anything remotely mid rangey or control. Okay, back to the build. Uh, we're not going to play Death Rattle. Let's just get this out of here. I don't think that's what we want to be doing. Uh, we need Mana Rocks. So let's do Function uh, Ramp. 
And we're gonna use a, a, um, a strategy here, which is gonna be like mostly two rocks because we really wanna go, we wanna have the ability to go turn three uh, Doom Scourge um, if, we, if we're under heavy pressure from say a gut player. Maybe a gut player, um, you, you know, I don't think the gut player should necessarily be coming after us. Um, I think that it's just a bad draft for them. And they're kind of stuck like doing the, you know, doing the demons bidding here. Um, but they may come after us. So Arcane Signet, definitely. Um, so this will allow us to do that early. Uh, we're definitely going to play Bonder's Ornament here. Um, we could play Walrus, although our sweepers will kill this. We're not playing Bubbling Muck. Charcoal Diamond and Fire Diamond, I think, are both good. Commander Sphere, maybe. This will probably be first on the chopping block. Uh, Deadly Derision or Deadly Dispute, we're going to play. Forgot about, forgot about that one. We could play Endless um, Decanter of Endless Water, but we're actually probably going to play um, Thought Vessel instead uh, because it's two mana. And our colors aren't going to be a problem. We're definitely playing Everflowing Chalice. Um, Felwar Stone. I think this is frequently only going to make one of the colors of mana, but that's fine. It's untapped. It's good. Fake your own death for the recur uh, the ability to reuse things. Fire Diamond. Flywheel Racer I've been really impressed with, but this card is much better in like a low, in like an aggressive deck. Like this one's pretty cool in um, decks where you can, you know, like in um, Thrall Parasite, which actually isn't aggressive. This is basically just another two mana rock that you can use with Thrall Parasite to make any color. And then it's like a 3-2 attacker. Um, one of the reasons I like these is that if you don't have any creatures and you lose the Monarch of the Initiative and somebody else has swept the board, so somebody does one of the classic things of like sweep the board with the Initiative of the Monarch, you can always like play your commander, animate this, and go grab it um, as a way to uh, gain it. And then you sit on it for a couple of turns. Yeah, it's basically another Springleaf Drum for two mana. And it's a creature. It's a 3-2 Vigilance creature. Like it's it's a good... It's like a Mind Stone, you know, or um, sorry, Guardian Idol or Fountain of Vicar, like this one right here. I really, really like these cards. Um, we might play this one in this deck just because if we do sweep the board and we don't have anything in play, we want to be able to do that, that thing that I just mentioned. Okay, Guardian Idol. Uh, maybe we, we do want our rocks to produce some color. Honored Heirloom, Infernal Idol. Infernal Idol is going to be very good in the deck. Um, <laughs> Tempt. First stage Tempt, we're not going to play any other Tempt cards in the deck, is not going to be good in the deck. Um, but there are decks where it will be. Lantern of Revealing is, is good. Lantern of Revealing, you can pair with the initiative. Uh, scry 2, put a land on top, activate Lantern of Revealing, put it into play um, as an option. Um, we could actually play Kozilex Channeler. This is basically like my preferred version of Sisse's Ring and Urgolem's Eye because it's also a 4-4. Um, the only thing is that, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll come back to this one. You can flip it off Throw to the Dead 3-2. Um, <laughs> Mana Geyser is pretty funny. We'll just throw this in the sideboard. We're, we're not going to be probably playing this, but... Um, Network Terminal, definitely. I really like Ornithopter of Paradise. It works great with Cranial Plating. I don't think we need Cranial Plating. I think it's going to be mostly unnecessary, kind of win more. Um, but it is two mana. I do like Prismatic Lens. The fact that it makes different color is great. Um, I don't usually play Clue Stone. I will almost always play Locket if I'm going to do it uh, because I prefer that it actually generate card advantage rather than just replace itself. And I think in these control decks, a mana sync like this is well worth playing. Uh, Rakdos Signet we're going to play. I don't think we need Sisse's Ring. I think we're going to want to have a lower curve with our ramp. Um, we are going to throw Songs of the Dam in the sideboard, although I just don't think we need it, to be quite honest. Star Compass, better than the two Diamonds. Um, Thought Vessel. I think we're probably there. We could play Unstable Obelisk as a form of removal. Um, although I usually see Unstable Obelisk not as removal, but as a um, as a way to unlock from a uh, an Oubliette. Um, but Unstable Obelisk does blow up lands. 
Keep that in mind. Uncounterable way to blow up lands. Unless they go um, Tamiyo Safekeeping, which, which uh, does, does wreck us. Okay. What else do we have here? Okay, that's it. Um, we're probably... I'm going to guess we're like six cards over, maybe five cards over. Fourteen. Okay. So quite a bit more. Um, so we got to get to work to start lowering... The, oh, we have 19 ramp spells. We are not going to play all of those. Lantern Revealing, prop, we're not going to be able to play Fountain of Vicar because um, we're only going to be able to play a couple of these um, ramp cards that um, are three mana. I like Unstable Obelisk here. Network Terminal is great for looting. We have 20 mana rocks. That's probably going to be like 16. I usually say for this card, for Cranial Plating as well, you need to have um, 15 artifacts in your deck. So I think we're, we're going to be right on, on, on par for that. Commander Sphere is going to go. Um, there could be an argument, though, for Infernal Idol going instead. Um, could be an argument for that. Uh, Prismatic Lens, I think, can go. Uh, how many two rocks? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's most of our allotment, so we can cut a little bit. I would love to have Guardian Idol, but I think we're going to have enough creatures that this is going to be fine. So let's cut that. Um, we're probably going to end up cutting one of these, I think. Mindstone's pretty good. Star Compass is good. Bonner's Ornament, Honored Heirloom. Lantern Revealing is not going to be... Not going to be what we want. Um, 14 rocks is still too many. Um, one, two, three, four, five... So we are going to have to cut from here. It's probably Infernal Idol. Yeah, Infernal Idol. Um, and then it's going to be some two mana rocks, probably like Fire Diamond and Charcoal Diamond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a good balance. 11 rocks is about fine. I don't know what the next one is, but we're just going to revisit that in a second here. Okay. Now, I'm just realizing that while I was talking about having cheaper creatures in the deck too with Evasion, we might not need that because Cardur basically says we don't need creatures in play to survive. And in this meta, creatures are really important as ways to apply pressure, ways to reduce pressure, either through disincentivizing attacks or making attacks really hard or, um, or trading or eating, soaking up damage. But Cardur kind of does that, you know? Cardur goads everything. So, you know, um, we, we always have the option to like ramp, play Cardur if we don't have any bodies and just kind of go at it that way. So I don't know that we need to have a low curve um, in this deck. Golden says cutting charcoal and fire diamond. Yep, um, we could also talk about Thought Vessel, but I think that this deck actually generates so much card advantage and we don't need to use it that we would like to be able to hold on to like 12 cards or 10 cards and not have to use it. Um, so I think that's a good card to have in the deck. This is fine for now. We'll, we'll come back to this. Um, Bloodfire Infusion, I think is gonna go um, because we actually just have the best sweepers in the format in black. Um, you know, instead of Arms of Adar, we could play something like uh, Evan Carr's Justice, which is reusable. And because of all the land cyclers we have to hit our land drops and all the ramp, um, something like that is basically like a stacks effect. The moment I say stacks, Fintorn Brownie is going to be summoned out of the ether. You just watch. I bet he shows up in the next 10 minutes just because I said it. Um, but basically when I say stacks, like stacks kind of doesn't exist in CPDH. Um, even though we have two commanders, Eidolon of Rhetoric and Phyrexian Sensor, both of them do have a stacks effect on them. But a stacks cr commander is not a stacks make deck make it does not mean you're a stacks deck. So when we talk about stacks, we're really saying control because the, the, the spells that are stacksy are actually sweepers. They're things that kill multiple things. They're discard effects that discard cards from everyone. They're edict effects that sack cards for everyone. Um, those are our stacks effects. And so they're really control effects. Um, however, um, if you want to call it stacks, sure, whatever. I think it's a little bit of a misnomer. And frankly, even though people like to use that terminology, I kind of like to move away from that stuff because, um, 
because stacks to a new player doesn't mean anything. And I am talking to new players. That's why I'm very thorough about explaining my thought process and reading off the cards and things like that. When you say stacks to a new player, they don't know what you mean. And stacks has nothing to do with playing effects that are called stacks today. Smokestack was a resource denial tool and that's where it got the name, okay? But stacks of today is like Winota type stuff. It's like rule of law, ghostly prison, these really restrictive effects that cause you to not be able to play the game. It slows the tempo down. It's limiting what you can cast, what you can do. And so I, I just find in general that kind of jargon is a little bit gatekeepy and it's not because people are necessarily trying to gatekeep, but it ends up having that effect. So we'll call it control in this space. And you guys can call it whatever you want everywhere else. What's up, Gator Bait? Good to have you here. Hey, hey, random stream. Good to see. Yeah, I um, you know, I, I got done with all the stuff I wanted to do today. I cleaned my room. Um, I, I had a bunch of groceries that I didn't have room for and a bunch of new clothes. Um, I'm like revamping my wardrobe for the first time in 10 years. Um, and so I had all this shit that's just been sitting around for like three weeks and I finally cleaned it up. And so I said, you know what? I'm excited about Cardoor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give myself a little treat and do a little impromptu uh, live stream, which helps me, helps you. So what's up? <laughs> Good to see you, Getter. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize um, Mindstone had a new uh, new printing. As the years had gnawed at it and the violent hands had maimed it, its head was gone and its place was a mockery, a round rough hewn stone rudely painted in the likeness of a grinning face with one large baleful eye in the midst of its forehead. That is so cool. Man, I... Guys, I am rock hard for Lord of the Rings, okay? I'll show you one sec. If you want a fantastic deck, or sorry, um, deck, <laughs> Freudian slip there. I think about magic all the time, so there you go. Um, if you want a fantastic book to increase your knowledge about Lord of the Rings and the whole metaverse, that exists around it. Um, I highly recommend this one right here. This is called The Illustrated World of Tolkien uh, by David Day. And this has uh, beautiful artwork from, from, the, from the story, pictured beautifully here in a nice matte finish and then an explanation of it. So this is Umbar and Carthage, the burning of it. Here's the Witch King of Angmar and a beautiful explanation of it. So this is actually a merging together of all the resources around Lord of the Rings. So the uh, illustrated world of Tolkien. Um, I've read the Silmarillion multiple times. I've actually visited Tolkien's gravesite, which is kind of hard to find because it's not listed with his. Um, it's not listed with his name. It's listed as uh, of the. It's listed of Baron and Luthien, which are two of his most beloved characters and one of the most beautiful stories I've ever read in any fantasy novel ever. Um, and that's because he saw him and his wife as Baron and Luthien. Um, so I, I'm a huge Tolkien nerd. Uh, there's going to be an upcoming stream someday in the future here with a Tolkien scholar and a really close friend of mine. Uh, he and I both took a class in college on Lord of the Rings. And, um, and so, yeah, recommend that book. But anyways, we got a couple comments from Gator. Stacks equals control. Control equals control. Rocks and boulders. Boulders and rocks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair, uh, Gator, to put it that way. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily make the equivalency between control and stacks. I know what people talk about, what they mean by stacks when they talk about it. Um, I just, I, I guess like I'm really working to, because, because our channel is the largest CPDH channel and the largest Popper Commander channel that's like dedicated to this stuff right now. I know that a lot of people's first foray into this format is going to be, um, is going to be in many cases with us. And so I'm really trying to be, like like a, a good steward of the format by using language that's really inclusive and, and stacks to new players doesn't mean anything. And I used to do a lot of like one-on-one um, uh, -on -one coaching and tutoring with people who've never played Magic before when I was running community events and stacks means nothing to people. It means absolutely nothing. That's why I always add in the parentheses popper commander or competitive popper commander next to the abbreviation because CPDH, CEDH, you know, 
Fugazi. It just it just doesn't it doesn't mean anything to people. And I want to be clear about what I'm talking about. So, anyways, that's my opinion on it. But you can do whatever you want. Everybody can do whatever they want. Um, weird way I've said to new players that helps the stacks effect. Yep. Yeah. So as long as you explain to players and you say, um, you know, if they're if they're more uh, if they're an older player and they they have been playing for a while, you just say, hey, stacks in this format is control control is stacks. There you go. 100%, that's a great statement. Less, uh, less is so much more for the new players. Exactly, yeah, totally. And I really think this format is the very best way, very best way for Magic players to get into, or for people to get into Magic. Hands down, this one and Popper, both. Um, you're working with a super inexpensive, accessible card pool. You're playing with a lot of limited cards that really teach people about value exchange, value loops, target priority, I mean, it, it's full of the kind of lessons that make a really great Magic player. And, um, and and its interaction is just... I've never said this before. I don't know if I want to, because I like to avoid hot takes. I, um, I, I like to keep an anti-drama bubble around myself as much as possible. And I think hot takes lead to this, and they're oftentimes inaccurate. So I'll speak at this from my personal perspective. I think that CPDH is the best format of Magic available. And the reason for that is accessibility, cost. I cannot reasonably sell a person on playing Magic if their deck is going to cost $700 to play Modern. I cannot sell them on it if I want them to play C CDH. You just can't. Standard, nope. Modern, nope. Legacy, nope. Um, they're all so expensive. And look... This deck is 70 bucks, 70 bucks, right? Like, uh, you know, and this is an expensive CPDH deck. And the reason CPDH and not necessarily PDH is because I think that a lot of people play casual subconsciously because they don't think that they're good enough or their deck isn't good enough. And I think that's not true. I think um, that uh, a lot of that has to do with price and accessibility. They're turned off by the price of CDH. They're turned off by the, the price of other formats. And so they just say, I play casual, I play kitchen tabletop. But look, this is a way that you can play cheaply where you can play powerful, flavorful, synergistic stuff on a super, super affordable budget. You know, I've got, I've got boxes of Magic cards here that cost me less than 20% of a CEDH deck or a modern deck. You could own all of this and pocket the change, or you can own a modern deck. And I just, as someone who's always trying to get people into magic, I think about that a lot. Like we really have to be like careful of the fact that like this game is super gate kept. Magic is a rich person sport or you make yourself poor playing it. And I think that's bullshit, okay? I think it's absolute bullshit that there's any limitation for anybody who wants to enjoy my favorite game ever made uh, just because they don't have enough money, you know? And I've been there. When I was a college student, my standard deck got banned. I played Aether, you know, uh, uh, Teamer Energy, and I all my cards lost all their value and I couldn't play competitively anymore. And it was such a huge feel bad. If you're playing modern and your deck gets, you know, out meta you know, maybe Tron isn't good anymore. Like, what do you do? You can't liquidate your cards easily. You just like, you. it's like Watsi says, just get fucked. Like, buy more cards, get richer. Good luck. Alex says, um, or Golden Leaf says, you have to, you have some good points. I usually play Commander casually. Yeah, and look, like even casual Commander is more expensive than Popper Commander. And CPDH is not that much more expensive than, um, than, than, uh, than, uh, um, than PDH. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is that increasingly the delta between what is casual and what is competitive in competitive popper commander is really small. You know, uh, there's like a really common thing that I notice where like casual decks, if somebody brings it in, end up winning the game because they clean up the scraps. And like say what you want about that, but like if your deck wins, it wins. If you are the least scary person at the table and you don't get people's limited interaction pointed at you, you are going to snowball and you are going to frequently win the game. So like, what does that mean about the deck? Is it bad? Is it not, ca is it not competitive? I don't know. You know, if it puts up results, like sure, fuck it. Why not? So uh, I, all those reasons, the interactivity of it, the really interesting card pool. I mean, look at this. We're playing Snuff Out, Thunderclap, right alongside initiative 
old, powerful, busted cards that see play in Legacy, like Lightning Bolt, Scred in, you know, Modern, you know, paired alongside with like Oubliette, super old card, you know, it's just, it's such a cool format. So I think it's the best. Maybe there's another way I could say it, which is this is my favorite, but I, I just... I feel strongly about that. And that's why this channel is dedicated to this format. Anyways, that was a really long rant. <laughs> I don't know if we lost, I, I don't check the viewers on these live streams when I'm doing it because it's just kind of a neurotic thing to do. Um, but I hope, uh, I hope I didn't uh, drive away anybody with the uh, off topic. Uh, oh, looks like there's still eight of you here. Cool, <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, Alex says, I didn't think I'd be good enough for competitive, but then I started playing and it turned out I wasn't bad at all. Yeah, Alex, you're a fantastic competitive player. Um, and, you know, like, like there's, there's no reason that a person can't learn to play magic in a powerful way. And I think a lot of people have that paradigm in their mind. A lot of people I know, when I would try to hand them a CPDH deck, they would be like, oh, I'm not good enough for competitive. And it's like, you just haven't been able to try it before because the, the cards were too expensive and you just weren't interested in spending that amount of money. So, um, Golden Leaf says, yeah, I only do casual because of, because uh, of the people I play with aren't very good sports when it comes to competitive and feel bad cards. Well, yeah. And, and that's reasonable. I, I would say too, that like magic players can be pretty sensitive. Um, and I think that has some tie-ins to like where, you know, the nerd community comes from. The nerd community has a lot of bases in, in like, you know, five years ago, being a nerd was not cool. Being a nerd was like, you know, a place of social derision. You could be ostracized for it. You know, 10 years ago, I got ostracized for it. I was not considered cool. I was considered a nerd. And all those things were bad. You know, I excluded from social circles and whatnot. And I think that a lot of um, people my age who are nerds uh, or older are, have a sensitivity built into them that, um, that, makes those feel bad moments, points of like tension where, you know, it can be kind of hard, but ultimately that's not your responsibility. You know, your responsibility, everybody's responsibility is to learn to love the game, whether you're winning or losing and accept that if you're playing something powerful, people are going to interact with you, plan for it, build your deck around it and, uh, and don't whine. Um, Alex says, I love the off topics. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Uh, you know, these streams, I'm not trying to like cater to any one person. I, it's really, it's like, I want to talk about stuff I want to talk about. And if people are here or not, that's, that's good. So, um, Alex is, <laughs> Alex is literally hurt me daddy. Play the, play the bad cards, make me suffer. I think that just earned uh, a pin, uh, from me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we should accept that we're playing powerful decks. And when people come at us, like, see it as a sign of respect. People see your deck and they're like, damn, okay, like, you're worthy of respect. I need to interact with you. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good thing. It's a compliment if you look at it that way. Okay, back to the deck, back to the deck. Um, okay, so we got all these draw effects. We need to get the deadly dispute effects in here. So we're going to do Reckoner's Bargain. Um, you can see Reckoner's Bargain is frequently going to gain us a metric fuck ton of life because our commander is four mana at the very least, but we also have a lot of really big things we can sacrifice in a pinch. I do like to show how much life gain I have because in a lot of mid-range decks, in a lot of control decks, you um, life gain is a really important part of being able to like make your way into the late game and not be super constrained on that particular resource. This is draw, this is also sacrifice. I might make a cate category for that just to see how many we have. It might not be fully necessary though. Um, we'll, we'll do it for now. Um, uh, you know what, actually, I think we can, do the, we can do the math on that without having a category there. That's a little bit of category bloat there. Um, this one is in draw, I believe. Um, and then we need deadly dispute. We have that one, uh, reckoner's bargain. Um, Oh gosh, Nasty End is such a good card right now. Um, Nasty End is the newly printed. Wow, look at the new art too. That is so freaking cool, man. I hope I have enough money to, uh, to buy some of the new cards from the set because I want all of these alternate arts. I love the, the, the lore 
in in uh, Lord of the Rings. This is super cool. So this card is going to be a, a draw three very regularly in our deck, and um, it's going to be super good. So let's do this one's going to be draw. Oh, we don't have Siphon Mind in here. Um, and I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to go and cut a couple of these, like Desert Ceridon probably goes, Quakefoot Cyclops could go as well, because uh, we're going to be really overloaded on draw, and we're going to need slots. <coughs> Let's see, where's our five mana? We also need to put Gary in here. Finhorn Brown. <laughs> Did somebody time that? I, th I think that was right at the 10 minute mark. I don't know how long that last rant was, but I... <laughs> we summoned him. Hello, Finhorn. Welcome to the live stream. Welcome to this stack stack. <laughs> oh my God, I'm dying. Finhorn, welcome to the chat. For those of you who don't know, Brownie is is like a real maverick in, in the format in that you know, uh, he's actively exploring areas that other people think are bad and showing that they're not. And that takes, uh, I'd say balls, but let's say balls, ovaries, whatever your genitalia is like, it, it takes guts to, to do that. You have to have a lot of self-assurance to know that, look, I'm going to try this. I don't care that people are going to hate on me. I don't care that people think it's going to be bad. I'm going to do it. And, you know, frankly, you know, if I were to look back through my decks, like most of them are things that people thought were bad. Um, Witherbloom Apprentice, Murmuring Mystic, Crackling Drake were the first three decks that I kind of brought into the meta. And all of them, people said they're tier four trash. They're just, they're garbage, right? Didn't stop me. And now those decks are like, you know, I think uh, Witherbloom Apprentice might be maybe like the second most viewed CPDH deck on, on Moxfield. So, um, so yeah, anyways, welcome Brownie. Glad to have you here. Um, okay, keep going. I don't think these cards are going to make the cut. We could keep Shiny Impetus. Um, we're definitely not going to keep Twisted Embrace. Uh, we have enough sweepers. We have too much removal. We're going to have to cut Ghastly Demise. Uh, the rest of these I really like. A Braid is good. Um, isn't there a... We have like Heartfire now as well. Collateral damage. Um, could look into those too. Uh, we have life gain here. We have to cut six cards. I I'm, I'm starting to kind of fall in love with maybe having the idea of like 12 rocks. Um, oh, and Brownie, by the way, if you want to um, if you want to rewatch it, I don't know what the time stamp on it. It was probably like 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, so like. Uh, one hour, 40 minutes. Um, I talked a little bit about stacks. Um, and if you want to see Brownie's stack deck, he's not going to be able to post it in the chat, but he has Phyrexian Sensor and he's been playing the crap out of that. And I'm sure he's been uh, having success with it too. So um, yeah. Okay, Gray Flickers. So let's get some more Gray Flickers. We're going to want Undying Evil. We're going to focus on the one mana ones. I don't want to go too deep on these effects. Uh, gray flickers. I just want to have like the most efficient one. Feign death. Uh, we're going to play Feign death. We're going to play Undying Malice. These cards are also really good with a lot of other things in the deck. If you, you know, when like you can see how everything ties together. Like we have all these powerful ETBs, um, you know, all these like really busted ways to like reuse the ETBs. Um, you know, if we like play, uh, if we like hit the throne of the dead three, get a chain devil, put it into play, we can grave flicker it and then sack that creature. We can sack the creature we just grave that we grave flickered to get two creatures. Um, you know, for the, for the price of our two cards here, we're going to get eight creatures off the, or six creatures off the battlefield, which is sweet. Um, but they also, they work with the Initiative, the Monarch, they work with a Faceless Butcher, um, with like our Arden Elementalist, um, you know, with anything we want to protect, it works with Cardur as well. Um, so let's do uh, Return, O Battlefield, um, O Graveyard, O uh, Type Instant. There's also... Um, Kaya's ghost form. 
I spelled something wrong. O graveyard, O return, battlefield. What did I spell wrong? So it, it should say it, when creature dies, return it to the battle. Oh, maybe it doesn't uh, say graveyard in it. Uh, yeah, which is going to make this harder, but okay. Um, we could play Ashnod's Intervention. This one's a little um, less efficient because it doesn't immediately put it in the, in the, in the battlefield, but um, Supernatural Stamina is the other one. I think those are the cheap ones. We could play Kaya's Ghost Form. I don't usually like playing Kaya's Ghost Form because these sorts of like protection effects played at sorcery speed are like asking for our commander to be removed. And then it's like a two for one, which I don't like. All of these work in response to removal, which like punishes their removal. Um, and I think that's the extent of that that we're gonna do. Cause these cards can also be kind of dead. They can be kind of dead sometimes. 110 cards, we have probably too many removal spells. Um, <sighs> okay, let's get the easy ones out. Let's get the Desert, Desert Ceridon out. Um, you know, Belligerent Guest isn't really necessary here. It's pretty spicy. It's an easy way to make blood tokens. Um, it dies to all of our sweepers, unless we make it bigger. Um, because we're starting to see that everything is looking pretty good here. Injector Crocodile is really nice here too. I was thinking about cutting it, but the reality is that Injector Crocodile actually is a great way to, if it does, you know, if we need to sack something, we can sack it and we're still gonna get the Incubate token, which is pretty cool. Ooh, Final Flourish is really good too. I really like this card. Um, this is a card that uh, that um, it's two mana instant speed. It can kill a gut. It, it can kill almost anything in the format. Um, it can kill Dargo if you need to sack a rock or a treasure or an artifact land. Um, it can sack a creature in response to removal, um, but it scales really well and it's instant speed. So I like this quite a lot. We could play this in the place of something like um, Doomblade, uh, but you know we have one, two, three only three things that can't target black creatures which is pretty good so i don't think we need to get rid of doom blade for that um this probably doesn't make the cut it could come in for shiny impetus shiny impetus is cool because it's going to ramp us and it's going to permanently goad something else into not attacking us and if we're not like really heavily flickering cardor then you know then we are going to want ways to um, we're going to want ways to make things not attack us. Uh, that's a possibility. I don't want to go down on creatures right now because I think we need like a, a certain threshold of them. Our curve is pretty high. That is kind of the area where it looks like we can cut the easiest. You know, we could cut an Edict Effect as well. Maybe um, maybe Fleshbag Marauder, because we do have these two. Or maybe it's Vraska's Fall, because we have lots of instant speed. I think we're going to cut Vraska's Fall. It's it's really good, but um, but I think we can these we prefer because they're flipped off the initiative. Um, I might be wrong on that, but come at me if you think so. Um, a braid, you know, we might not need this kind of uh, flexibility. This feels bloated. Shiny Impetus starts to feel that way too. Shiny Impetus is just so good though. It's like, man, you put this on somebody else's big thing and they never come at you for the rest of the game until, until you have to 1v1 them. Um, and they're giving you treasures. They're like ramping you. Um, 
Oh, that's not an untagged artifact. That is a ramp spell. Um, we need to get all that stuff into ramp as well. I think I would like to have a 12th rock in here, but I don't know how we're going to make the room for it. Um, Honored Heirloom. Network Terminal. Alex Scott says, what's the merit of Thunderclap over Shiny? Uh, Thunderclap is mana-less. Um, it's just a very good card. I mean, Gator's in here. He could tell you, uh, you know, Thunderclap kills, like, everything other than Pneumotic Wall that's like a combo card. And being able to hold up interaction when we don't have mana is strong. And being, you know, it's only one man. It's, it's only a land. Um, you know, uh, think that there's it's a reasonable it's a reasonable card oh we don't have pyroblaster reb in here and i do think we want those i was kind of of the mind uh, for a long time that these cards were not something you needed to play anymore but the meta has shifted back towards having a lot of blue in it and so i think that these cards are not staple, but they're they're damn good. Um, they're 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 very good, and they help protect our stuff when our stuff is worth uh, doing. Uh, you know, blood frenzy. Um, I really like this card. Um, it's kind of funny because blood frenzy. Like, if we go blood frenzy on something, everybody knows it's gonna die. So if we feign and feign death it, or we do some sort of grave flicker nobody's going to want to kill it in response, right? It's, it's already going to die. So it's like very card positive for us because if it resolves, whatever we, we're using on is probably good. Um, blue is love, blue is life, indeed. Um, it, might not, it might be that we don't need this many. It might be that we could cut something like read the, read the bones. Um, I like read the bones a lot, but like we have 19 draw spells. We have more than 19. Like technically revolutionist and ardent elementalist are draw spells as well. Um, and in fact, all of these are draw spells. Um, so actually, let's um, we're not going to stack this one because it's a different kind of draw, and I don't want to get confused on that. Um, so it's yeah, it's a different kind of different kind of draw. So we're overloaded on draw spells right now, which means we could cut something like read the bones. It's a good card, but like I don't think we're going to need it. Um, one two three sack effects. Um, the nice thing is a Reckoner's Bargain and Deadly Dispute sack rocks two. Nasland is draw three. This is really only one mana because it's making a treasure. I don't think we need to go into the like um, Corrupted Conviction uh, Village Rights level of things, but we potentially could. Um, you know, Falconrath Celebrants um, is a good card. I do like how Falconrath Celebrants allows us to turn a land cycling card into a draw card, which is quite nice. And it's at a discount because usually the cycling for a land is two mana. And this will make it one draw card instead of that, which could be better than finding a land. Um, definitely. Wow. Yeah, we're definitely at the point where it's like pretty hard to find cards. We're going to cut Belligerent Guest. Um, just be super ruthless here. Removal has got to come down. This is, this is too much. Uh, we could cut um, we could cut Doomblade, or we could cut something like Grasp of Darkness because um, of the extra pip. Grasp of Darkness does not kill really big things, so there is that. Victim of Night does. Ashes to Ashes is really good, but it is sorcery speed, and like increasingly, sorcery speed is like less ideal. Um, but it is high value, very high value. Finn says, uh, or Brownie says, all right, I listened. Card to stack seems like a great idea. Excited to see what you do with it. Yeah. Um, like we started out with a mid range deck, but I think that this actually wants to be control. I think that that's where, where, where we're at. Like, yeah. Uh, oh, I'd love to, uh, I'm gonna have to put that Doom Slayer song on again. God, if you oh by the way, if you guys get a chance, um, let's see. 
if we go to YouTube, um, we can see here, um, check out, check this out if you want to be impressed. Um, speed runs on, on, um, on Doom, Doom Eternal. If you want to be like really eternal, if you want to be really impressed, this stuff is insane. Like not, not necessarily the speed runs, but like the, the stuff where people are like moving really quickly. Cause you'll see just how insane people are with like swapping weapons and everything. It's, it's really fun to watch. So anyways. Um, okay. So we've got two free ones. I like executioner's capsule right now. I think that this card being an onboard trick is really good in a control deck. We can play it early and it's going to be something we can sacrifice if we don't need it as an artifact while also just being like an onboard thing for like a, an untapper. Um, and if somebody like goes into their combo and they don't care that this is here, you know they have Tamiyo safe complete, uh, safekeeping or intervene or confound. So um, I like this, it, it gives us a lot of information. Um, a braid is also maybe not a card I'm caring about that much. Um, it's nice and flexible, but it's also like the worst removal spell we have. The flexibility of it is good. Um, but like, maybe we need to cut something else that's not that. Um, damn, all these are so good. Like Ashes to Ashes is one of the only instant speed ones that we have that's like not, like not instant speed. But in the same vein, it's like, yeah, it's not instant speed um, and that's okay. Um, because we have lots of instant speed. Same with shiny impetus. Um, damn, we're a little bit stymied here, a little bit stuck in like, what do we, what do we cut? Um, we have a lot of draw, so we technically could cut something like pointed discussion. Um, pointed discussion definitely could go. It's like three mana draw to with like the ability to cycle on it, which is nice. Uh, but I, you know, maybe that's not super important if we have all these other ways of getting value. Um, we're gonna put this one in sideboard cause we're gonna come back to that one. Final Flourish is gonna go to the sideboard as well. Now we're down to 106, 20 removal spells, two edicts, that's 22, um, 27, 27. This is more kill spells than I think I've put in a deck in a long time. And I don't know, and that's actually doesn't even include Unstable Obelisk. Um, 28. Or the fact that we can like Grave Flicker our Edicts or our Faceless Butcher. <clears throat> Damn. All right, chat, give me your recommendations. I'm gonna need some help here. We need to make six cuts. It can't come from, it could come from Ramp. We could cut two ramp cards uh, that would get us down to 104. Then what are the next cards after that? Um, what are the next spells that we're gonna get rid of? It probably needs to come from removal, right? Uh, Brownie says Norit, the, Norit in the list. Some players try to find ways to tap their creatures to not have to attack with them. Fiery Cannonade could probably go Norit. Untap target blue creature? What is this card? I have a pretty encyclopedic knowledge of commons and I've seen this one, but I basically skipped over the text. Non-wall creature and active player is continuously controlled and they have to, uh, they have to attack and then they sack it. Huh. So this is like forcing people to attack with things. The only problem I see here is we already have Cardor which can make people, which can goad people into attacking. Um, fiery Cannonade, I don't think we're gonna be cutting just because having some cheap ways to sweep the board is gonna be good because we're not fully leaning into like the extra degenerate like uh, Cardoor stuff. I just don't like how that kind of stuff invites people to always look at our Cardoor as, as something that they can kill. Um, you know, even if Cardoor isn't the problem, like two for ones are pretty spicy. Lightning Bolt is really good, but it's not as good as the others. That's a good point. Um, Lightning Bolt goes face though. And there's something to be said for that uh, in a deck that burns people, you know, casually. Um, 
Ashes to Ashes could easily be the cut, um, which would make us a super, super scary player to a combo player. Like they're gonna be really scared for a variety of reasons. One, we're making everybody attack them, right? Like, or other people. Um, so like in a lot of cases, the attackers are gonna not go towards me and they're gonna go towards them um, because they're gonna be really appealing as a, as a kill target. Um, and so, and then we have all this instant speed interaction. Pestilence and Crypt Rats, which is why I was saying, uh, but, you, but I see your point. I mean, we have too much removal. I think that's the, that's, the, that's the TLDR here. Not too much necessarily, but it's just like a lot. Um, you know, there's cards like Injector Crocodile, Lava Serpent. These ones are kind of like among the worst of these. Yeah, this is hell for a combo deck for sure. And we could make it worse, you know, like for Flicker decks, we could have a card like Bloodseeker or Poison Belly Ogre in here um, that drains everybody else for playing creatures. Um, they're like stacks effects in a sense uh, in black, or you have like Falconrath Noble. Falconrath Noble would be pretty heavy here um, because everybody, everything's going to be dying. Like we could easily put Falconrath in here. Currently, we have like more than 25 draw effects, which is insane. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's just that I don't want to erode the ability to, like we need to have enough creatures to make uh, this package right here good. To make this good, we need to have um, that package. And, um, and, I, and I'm hesitant to cut any of these because we are testing that hypothesis. Um, so no, Narit makes it so if they don't attack, if they tap down, then they have to destroy it at the end of combat. Let's look back at Narit. Maybe I misread that. Okay, choose target non-wall creature that player has continuously controlled since the beginning of the turn. That creature attacks this turn if able. So it's goaded, but it can attack us. Destroy it at the beginning of the next end step if it didn't attack this turn. So if it can't attack, so if they tap it down, Instead of attacking, then they lose it. Um, activate only before attackers are declared. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Norit is good for that. And you can reuse it over and over again. Um, I think this card is pretty good. I'm concerned that it's a four mana one one, that it has to untap to do its thing, and that it's... Um, I don't think this is going to make the cut. I don't think it's going to make the cut. It's just like, I would almost, so if we're talking about re repeat removal, a card that I would rather play is uh, Kumbaj, which is, um, which we might play anyways. Uh, one mana or one damage to any target and then one damage to any target of an opponent's choice. Uh, this is a really cool political tool that we can use where we can like, point it at a creature and then choose an opponent who wants something to die and kill with this. This kills untappers for days. Uh, it's also a one, three with two black pips. Um, like we probably should be playing this anyways. It's a great blocker. Um, we don't have anything that actively dies to this that we don't care about. Like we're never going to play it alongside Fleshbag Marauder in a way that they're able to punish us. Um, so like we should be playing this card. It's it's very good. It kills gut. If people want that thing dead, we can collaborate and say, hey, help me kill this gut. Uh, we can kill a lot of different stuff with it. Um, and plus, this is one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful cards printed into Popper in a long time. This is one of my favorite art pieces. Probably get a, a play mat with this art on it someday. Classic uh, Seb McKinnon um, art there. Um, now we just went up removal, which is silly. Uh, but yeah, like what's bad here? Um, we could we could get rid of you know the double pip stuff like um, like oh, we already got yeah like grasp of darkness which we already got rid of. Victim of night is so unconditional that I'm not gonna cut it. Like it kills everything that matters basically. Um, ashes to ashes could go. Um, let's do that. You know shiny impetus could go as well. We talked about reducing the ramp. Um, I, I really like this card though. I, it just feels weird not to play it. Um, you know, we could cut like two of these. Um, 
like Jesus Christ, like Bonner's ornament is draw, network terminal is draw, um, Mindstone is draw. So much draw in this deck, so much draw, along with all of our cyclers and our recursion effects. That's probably where it needs to come from. There could be an argument in this deck for not playing Knight's Whisper and Sign and Blood. I've done that on a number of occasions. Um, they're really good, they're really efficient, but like this deck might not be playing them. You know, like just might not be playing them. But again, this is where the this is where the cuts need to come from. Cast down could go. Blood Frenzy seems exceptional in the deck. A braid could probably go. So let's just put a braid. Uh, cut that one for now. I think we're gonna put it in considering because we we do want this one or in sideboard because we want to keep that one in mind. Um, let's clean this up a little bit. Shredded sails we're not gonna do. Uh, Exhum, I don't think is going to be a card we play. Dragon Shadow and Dragon Breath. I think, if anything, I would play Dragon Breath. Um, although an unblockable creature is definitely appealing. Uh, we'll leave them here for now. You're Already Dead is cool. Um, Songs of the Damned is cool. I just don't see room for any of these. Spinning Darkness into Considering. The Foul we don't need because we have Wrecking Ball. Um, Diagraph Scavenger, really cool, but I just don't think we need it. Uh, Diagraph Horde, kind of the same thing. Ingot Shewer, um, maybe, but again, like, you know, we could just play a Braid and I think it'd be happier. Kozilek's Channeler, great card, but we're also not playing Urgolem's Eye and Sisse's Ring, which is where we usually like this card. Um, so I don't think we're going to flip it. Um, we don't really care about getting lots of mana all at once. The Rise Again Summon Undead is definitely a place that I'm interested in. Um, so I think all this stuff is relevant. Um, because these, these kind of represent like a different kind of deck, right? And I just want to be cognizant of that. Um, man, we're spinning our wheels though. Where are the cuts? Um, we could do Falconrath Celebrants. This doesn't put itself in the graveyard. It's just a 4-4 four, four Menace for four. The blood tokens don't really, they, they only help us work with our cyclers. And it's like not super synergistic with the rest of our deck. Um, Horror of the Broken Lands I want to keep. Quakefoot Cyclops, making things not block, is like not super relevant, but it's draw card. Um, and it makes it so that things can probably uh, go. Falconrath can go. Yep, Falconrath went. I like Street Wraith here. I think this is going to be another card um, that like actually has a good home here. Um, these white bordered lands are hurting my eyes. They're really hurting my eyes. No, no. Switch printing. There we go. Sure. Wow, these are 24 cents a piece. Crazy. Um, so sick. Um, those will be Snowlands, too. Okay, Wander and Death, we can't cut. Faceless, no, no, no. So none of those are cuts. Um, oh, my God. Using Ardent Elementalist with um, Reaping the Graves is particularly disgusting. Particularly disgusting. You could see a turn where you go, like, you know, Nasty End, Deadly Dispute, Reckoner's Bargain, sack that thing, add to the storm, cast Reaping the Graves, get it back, draw like uh, approximately a million cards. Um, there's a part of me that thinks that these like impetus cards, like that both of them need to be here because of the fact that like Card or Doom Scourge won't be goading everybody every turn, um, which is probably fine. Um, Witch's Cottage is instant speed. This is another like mean to combo players kind of a card. Um, Capsule could probably go. Um, Thunderclap might go, um, although I think this is good. Turns like this is where I want Songs of the Damned. Yeah, Songs of the Damned with um, with that is pretty good. Although that there's, I think there's a good chance that it, that there's not enough creatures in the deck to do that. Like I think it's gonna represent a draw, like a you know, maybe like a five mana ritual in some cases, but still like, why do we need rituals? I, I just think rituals are probably like the wrong thought for the deck. Oh, there's another go for the throat printing. Whoa. Oh my God. I'm so fucking moist for this. Holy shit. That's so good. It's so flavorful. I'm replacing all of those go for the throats with this. Is there another printing? No, just that one. I didn't know there was a foil version of that one. The one that I have in foil is the uh, Mirrodin Besieged one. There's also a Judge promo that's really sick. Uh, this one right here. This is my favorite one. Um, 
four more cuts probably needs to come from removal. I think that there's definitely an argument for cutting like edicts these days, but I think we need to have two of them. Um, edicts also giving us another way to like feign death on our commander. Um, we just keep coming back to removal over and over again. In Rakdos, you've got so much good removal that it's like really hard to uh, cut. The sweepers here are pretty good. We probably don't need Arms of Adar. It's a great card, but like... Now that only that means we only have one sweeper in Pestilence um, to deal with that, with, with, um, with the gut player and Echoing Truth. So that's probably wrong. Um, I think just to not confuse ourselves, we're going to remove this tag from removal because it's not really a removal spell in the traditional sense. Cast down could go because it's not, uh, it's a little limited in what it can hit. Let's do that. Yeah, this deck is super oppressive to uh, combo decks. Super oppressive. Um, two more cuts could come from ramp. I don't think I want to cut shiny impetus. I think this card is too good to be cutting. Um, it could be thought vessel. We don't really care if we have to discard cards. Um, we'll cut that one. And then we have one more, which could be, um, ooh, uh, we could cut one of these, you know, maybe like fake your own death. Um, we could cut like Night's Whisper, Sign in Blood, and then put like another ramp spell back in. Um, that's probably a pretty disciplined thing to do. Because I really don't think that these cards are... Like, look at this. Oh, we don't even have Stirring Bard in here. We don't even have the other Monarch cards. Oh, no. Chat, we missed them. How did you let this happen to me? Stirring Bard is great in this deck. Um, oh, geez. We don't have <laughs> Crown Hunter Hireling. We don't have Crimson Fleet Commodore. These are, like, the reason to play the deck. Okay, yeah, we're definitely cutting Night's Whisper and Sign and Blood. Because now, now we're completely fucked. Um... What's the other one that I'm missing? Uh, Crimson Fleet. The only reason we wouldn't run Crimson Fleet is because it dies so easily, but the Monarch is so damn strong in this deck. Um, okay, so now we're up a bunch more cards. We're gonna cut this. This is gonna look crazy, but like cutting Sign and Blood and Night's Whisper is, is potentially, in a lot of cases, completely fine. They're really efficient, but um, we would rather have the ability to sacrifice something and reuse it with a Grave Flicker or get it back with one of our other recursion spells then lose life. Um, even though they're efficient and they're like the raw power of them is definitely there. Um, you know, we could cut something like Quakefoot Cyclops. How many cards do we have that cycle? One, two, three, four. Um, five. No, one, two, three, four. And then we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, I mean all these are draw spells too, so I think I'm I'm happy with that. Eighteen plus two is uh twenty, twenty-four, twenty-four removal spells is like about par for a control deck. Two more cards. God damn. Uncle Sam, god damn. This balance is right where I like it. Mostly to, uh, you know, and then maybe like like 60%, 70%, two, and then some threes is, is fine. Um, I hate that my brain keeps coming back here and saying Lava Serpent or, you know, Injector Crocodile or um, Quakefoot Cyclops because these cards are part of our plan. But we have 27 now, so we could say, you know, maybe Quakefoot Cyclops goes. Um, I'm, it's more important to me that we get lands 
early than it is drawing cards. Um, drawing cards is something the deck already does perfectly fine. Um, let's do Quakefoot Cyclops. I think that's a disciplined thing to do. Um, oh, this is actually five mana value. Since we have so many land checkers, yeah. Yeah, we just want to hit our land drops. That's way more important to us. Um, one, two, three, the land cyclers, yeah. Um, like, I still want Arms of Adar in here. I think that's... Oh, we don't even have Breath Weapon. Where did Breath Weapon go? Damn it. Um, chat, you're supposed to be... You're supposed to be um, catching me on this shit. Um, you know, Breath Weapon... Yeah, we definitely want that. Um, fuck. We could cut Fake Your Own Death. Um, maybe we don't need four of these. Um, but it is part of the card to our plan. <sighs> what is extraneous and not part of our hypothesis? Um, I mean, these two technically, but these are really, really good in the deck. They're really good. They're great in Rakdos control, right? Because any one of these can get back some really busted. There's 27 instants and sorceries in the deck we can get back with them. Um, we could cut one thing from here. We could cut... Uh, it would probably have to be a two-mana rock because these three-mana rocks are pretty important. Unstable Obelisk is good. It is a little excessive. We don't necessarily need this, but it feels very good in the meta right now. Um, could cut something like, uh, oh, those are all really good. Could cut the Edict, you know, maybe Fleshbag Marauder, Chain Devils, Tutorable, Demir Houseguard. Edicts are not very good right now, just in general, but we have a way to tutor for it if we need it. Um, and we have ways to reuse both of these, so they're, they're pretty sick. They both put themselves into the graveyard. Um, technically, we don't need Kumbaj Witches, but it feels like this is here for a reason. Um, Faithless Looting might be better than some of the draw spells we have. Um, in all honesty, I really don't like Faithless Looting. I think that Faithless Looting needs a deck that, like, I mean, it does. we do use the graveyard a lot here, um, but it... Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is actually a better Faithful Saluting deck than, than maybe I'm initially giving cut, credit for. We could cut the Edicts, um, that does take our removal down more, but again, these Edicts are just feeling bad right now. It's like Gretchen player has like, you know, Gretchen in play, they just happily sack it. Um, TPI doesn't care, Gut doesn't care. Um, you know, Malcolm decks tend to care. Um, but again, if, you know, they sack, you know, sacking Dargo is usually not that bad for them if they have Dargo. Um, Tatiova decks, pretty creature light. Usually they'll, they'll have to sack either Tatiova or their, or their creature. Um, but there's just a lot of decks that don't care. Abdel, you actively don't want these against Abdel because it allows them to reuse Abdel. Um, or they just sack a token. You know, admittedly, the worst ones here are probably Furnace Host Charger and Injector Crocodile, but both of these are doing exactly what the game plan, what, like what we're trying to test right now. And maybe that tells us that there's not space for them. That's possible. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to test this. I, I want to do it. I'm, I'm being stubborn. You know, Unsealed and Acropolis is another one that we could cut. Like, we don't necessarily need a lot of these. Blood Fountain, Reaping the Graves, and Wander and Death are my favorite ones, and I think they're the best ones. So Unsealed and Acropolis could go. Um, and look, we, like, draw so many cards that, like, Unsealed and Acropolis is, like, not necessary. Um, like, we only need to hit one of these to get a lot of value out of it. We have lands that can do it. Um, there's four of them. So currently that's like, you know, we're at like one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, 24 draw spells, basically. Uh, 
Okay, so it's one out of here. Let's just cut a two mana ramp spell. We're gonna cut um, Star Compass. We're just gonna we're gonna go fast and loose. We're gonna cut that one, and then let's cut um, Capsule. Uh, both of these cards are gonna want to be in our uh, considering. Okay, so we have a hundred cards. Let's see if we can run this through some games. Uh, we're just gonna assume our basics are are that we have all the mana we need. This is an insane hand. Um, this hand is going to allow us to play turn three initiative while cycling our Horror of the Broken Lands to draw more cards with Pyro up. Um, this is one of the reasons why we might want to run Dark Ritual is that, again, we have a lot of stuff that if we turbo it out, it's so strong. Um, so I, I do like the idea of Dark Ritual here. Oh, see, like, look at this. We're hitting all of our damn land drops, all of them. You know, we're, we're going to function this game, right? So we go one mana. Um, we're going to hold this until we play the Arcane Signet because we want to know if we get anything else good. Maybe we don't need to cycle it and we can just hard cast it because we're getting into that territory here. So we draw for turn, go uh, land into Arcane Signet. Um, we have Siphon Mind now, so we definitely don't need... Uh, we just want action. So is it better to hit a land drop here? I think it is, because next turn, we're not gonna be cycling Gloomfang Mauler. Next turn, we're gonna go turn three, Stirring Bard, turn four, Cardor with Pyroblast up. So I think we can cycle this card um, off of the Arcane Signet, and then we'll draw. And let's have the um, uh, creatures here and non-creature non spells here. There's the Monarch, um, and arguably I like Stirring Bard first better. Um, okay, draw. Faceless Butcher is great. Um, we'll play a land. We'll play Stirring Bard. This is the other reason we don't need um, this. We're just go. Let's just go mount. We don't have any mountains, so let's go swamp. Grab this. Put it into hand. Um, I doubt anybody is able to do anything to us next turn, and we have everything we need. So we could put counters on this to make it hard to attack through it, um, or we could scry to. We have all the cards we need, all the value we need. We probably just want like, so I think we'll put the counters on this, just make it a good blocker. It's kind of weird. We could scry to as well. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll do that. And then we'll draw for turn because that's all an upkeep. Play a land. Look look how close we are to casting Gloomfang Mauler already. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go one, two, three, four, cast Cardor. So now we're guaranteeing ourselves another run through of this. Oh, we do want the Monarch. Say somebody interacts, we Pyroblast to keep it. And then we can tap this to give this haste, go to combat, hit somebody. And then upkeep, we're gonna goad a creature, draw. Oh, look at this. Yeah, this is where the edicts get really good because everybody's murdering each other and now we get to run out the, um, the initiative. One, two, three, four. We can hold this up to cycle it. So we play the uh, Monarch. So we're now we're gonna have the initiative and we're gonna duplicate that, uh, flip this over, put one, two, three things on it. And we've got the uh, Monarch as well, like that. So end step, we're gonna draw a card. Like, good luck getting through this too. This is a really scary set of blockers. We could have technically given this haste to hit somebody for five. Um, so we drew it end step. Next turn, we're gonna untap and we're gonna go, um, we could just draw a card to make sure we hit our land drop or we could make a four one. I kind of want to draw a Grave Flicker effect right now, but we have ways to like oppress the the uh, the the board right now with Chain Devil, so we don't really need to. Um, let's make a token. We're just gonna say it's a zombie token um, because the four ones unfortunately don't show up based on the way Moxfield is. So we'll do that. Um, and you know we could cycle these to hit our land. So let's do that at end step. We'll cycle this away to go and get ourselves a um, where to go. Oh, there we go. To go get a um, Witch's Cottage. Like that, um, which we can play to get one of these back and draw it at end step. It's pretty sick. You can, with Monarch, you can, you know, do this and then find lands. Um, and then we'll draw for turn. Mortuary Mire means we're going to get both of these back. Um, 
So now what we're going to do is go uh, one, two, three, four. And we're going to, with this, we're going to, oh, actually, you know what we can do? We'll go one, two, three, four, chain devil, sacrificing chain devil. <coughs> and then playing, um, we could keep this for an untapped land. Two mana up allows us to cycle um, this and that if we want to, um, which is pretty good. And then we can just get them back when we draw a recursion spell. But I think we're in the standpoint of wanting to cast these now. So we go Witch's Cottage into play, untapped, or um, we could technically go Mortuary Mire to get back Horror. Because horror is gonna could draw us another card, but we've got so many so much card draw going. Um, we're gonna get back Gloomfang, and this is gonna go on top. And then uh, end step, we're gonna uh, draw a card, and we're probably gonna have to do some blocking now. So we're probably gonna block with this and block with that, so that we don't have to give this up. We could even block with this, send it to the command zone. So say we got clapped really hard, now we're just gonna recast this. Um, and we're drawing this off Monarch. Next stage is going to be Throne of the Dead 3, so we're going to untap. We're going to go 1, 2, look at that. This thing is absolutely huge off of the throne. It's such a big creature. Crypt Rats. That's a game over right there. This right here is game over on turn 6, even if the game doesn't look over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Even Lava Serpent's terrifying. 8, 8, Haste. So we're going to put the Crypt Rats into play with uh, counters on it. And then we'll uh, shuffle this. Uh, bottom of library, shuffle, draw for turn. And now we'll go... Um, I would like to get my lands. Um, so we're going to go Witch's Cottage. Um, we could actually just cast... Cardor. One, two, three, four, five, six. That would give us two mana up. So we could go one, two, three, network terminal. Actually, what we want to do is not cast network terminal because we want to have mana for this. So we're going to cast Cardor. If it gets countered, let's say it gets countered. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we play Witch's Cottage, and we're gonna bring back um, we're gonna bring back Chain Devil on top, which we're gonna draw off Monarch, and then we're gonna have two mana up for Crypt Rats, so we'll give haste, attack with this, and then uh, when somebody tries to kill us, we go this, we pop it for two to sweep the board again, um, upkeep. We're gonna go untap Swamp grab a swamp, um, and then we'll, oh, we also drew, oh, we actually, we needed to draw the um, Chain Devil off of the Monarch, um, close and shuffle, and then we're gonna draw for turn. Land drop, one, two, three. Now I think we, we have this effect in play, so we're gonna lean into just like really oppressing the board with this. So we're probably not gonna play our Edict. Um, play one, two, three, Network terminal, just going to develop our board. And this is uh, reset counters. Now it's down to one again. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mana. This is where we go one, two, three, four, five, six into Gloomfang Mauler. We could play Gloomfang Mauler or we could to put counters on something. So let's put counters on the Gloomfang Mauler and we'll uh, basically, now we only have one mana though. So maybe what we would do is we don't play that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We hold up two and then we basically attack with both of these. We give it haste, menace, all that stuff. And then uh, we kill the board again after drawing our card and then we're gonna 
untap, we're gonna put more counters on one of these, which would probably be the, like the Crypt Rat's probably died at this point. We just keep that in mind, but um, we'll do that and we'll draw. There we go. Okay, so like this is nine turns. You can see that we completely oppress the board by producing a turn three initiative followed by a turn five, uh, turn four uh, Cardur, turn five Monarch. Um, and like the table is gonna struggle with this. We are, we are fully like Nicol Bolas arch enemy here and we are oppressing the shit out of the table with this. Like this is a deck that will probably take on the position of arch enemy and look at all this card advantage here. This is so stupid. We could draw four, you know, we've got this to loot if we need to, we can just start casting big creatures. Um, we have a way to, you know, do this bullshit um, or this bullshit. Like all of this stuff is super good. And our mana is perfect. We can cast our commander as many times as we want. Um, and, and we have a Crypt Rat, so it's utterly massive. Um, so let's try another one. And then we're going to go back to the deck. Um, this one here, unfortunately, missing a land. If we weren't missing a land, we would be able to cycle this. You can see how a single other land would put us in the territory of having four mana and a turn three card or or, you know, a, you know, any, yeah, just very strong. So we gotta restart that. No lands. Bummer. Statistically unlikely. We're down to five. Uh, four. <laughs> Getting bit a little bit there. We'll take Fake Your Own Death, Oubliette, um, and Undying Evil. So let's see how this looks with a... Um, Oh, we weren't supposed to shuffle, but whatever. Um, let's look how it does with a four, four, four land hand. We'll draw a card, feign death, okay. So we'll go one. Uh, we are actually just gonna cycle this away for a dual land. We're gonna go get a swamp. This is actually gonna be a dual land. So we'll put this into play, um, put this into our hand, and then draw. This is gonna be a tap land, because we have a turn three rock here. Draw, okay, so these are not great right now. Maybe the Grave Flickers aren't where we want to be. It's possible. I mean, Pestilence is pretty good with the amount of mana we have. So why don't we go one, two, three, four, Cardur, get some people off our back. And then if somebody goes to kill it, then we like Undying Evil. Let's say that we had really bad luck with our draws. And so maybe the luck goes our way this game. We flicker it. Everybody's goaded again. It's now five, four. Draw, one, two, three. Any point we get a Monarch here is gonna be really good. I don't think we wanna run out of Pestilence right now because it's gonna make us like enemy number one. We're gonna swing because, um, you know, people are goaded. Draw, Lightning Bolt, um, not great. So I think at this point we just possum and we say, okay, we don't have anything. We mulligan low. People are probably not coming after us. Draw, pretty dead, pretty dead. And with like 25 draw spells in the deck, I think that this is obviously not looking very good, but it's like kind of atypical. So we're sandbagging this really hard. Now we can play this right here. And then we'll get this back next turn to just cast. So on this turn, we're actually gonna go one, two, three, four. Uh, we're gonna play Pestilence. And now we're gonna start to put on the, put the hurt on people if, uh, you know, if people mess with us, we can Pestilence. If they kill our commander, we can Undying Evil or uh, Feign Death. Um, and we probably have to use all of our mana here. This is gonna be our, our draw for next turn. So we go here and we draw. And one, two, three, four, five, six. We're gonna cast this with two mana up. And then we do our, do our Pestilence thing. Draw a card. Blech. I mean, but the funny thing is, like, look, we have these two huge creatures. One of them's evasive. The other one people don't want to kill because if they kill it, we're actually going to goad. But this is turn 10. We flooded out pretty hard. We kept uh, two lands and a virtual land with this one, and we drew uh, four more as well as just another rock. So we'll restart. Again, no lands in hand. That feels painful. Down to seven again. What are these draws? Down to six? Okay, I mean, yeah, this works. So we'll put back um, Thunderclap, I think. We could also put back Bajuka Bog, bottom of library, draw for turn, uh, play this. We're probably gonna cycle Wander and Death. Yeah, we're gonna cycle this away, draw a card. 
Um, at least we have a sweeper on deck right now, but this is definitely looking kind of sad. Um, we probably don't need to sweep, uh, but we but we could. We'll draw for turn. Uh, we are just going to cycle this away for two, play our land, um, play Cardor, and pray that we get another land for Underdark Explorer, because then we can Underdark uh, get our uh, land Underdark, have our sixth land, sweep the board, um, or kill things. There's our land. Okay, so let's um, reorganize this a little bit. We're gonna play the Underdark Explorer. We're gonna go and get a swamp here. Um, catch that. Um, we don't have any way to sweep the board now and things are not goaded, so they're probably coming after us. We might have to give up the initiative here, but we'll attack to get it back. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, draw for turn, and I think we're probably, we didn't, we're, we're not gonna give ourselves the second trigger of the initiative because we probably had to give it away. Um, but we'll go and we'll attack and we'll get it back. Um, and then we'll play our land. Um, now we have a sweeper up. We could actually go one, two, three Crypt Rats. And then the Crypt Rats kills both of these, which kind of sucks, but allows us to reuse our Cardor again while we sit on the initiative. We also have this and this and this to protect our butts. So we could also just like hold these things up, which I think we'll do. Um, so we're going to get the trigger. We're going to put the counters on Cardur. Actually, there is an argument here. You go one, two, three, Crypt Rats before. Um, yep, you can forge, exactly. So I'm going to forge up onto the Crypt Rats because that's really strong. And now we can Crypt Rats and keep, we can Crypt Rats for two. We can snuff something out. I'm assuming this is one of these is red so that we can pyro if we need to. We also have Thunderclap if one of these is a, a mountain. Um, so let's just say we go one, two there. Let's expend our resources just to assume, like assume the worst case scenario. So we're gonna go uh, thunderclap sacking this land. Let's just say it goes really bad. It goes really south. We want to defend the initiative because we're low resources. We need to ride it. Um, and then we're gonna go upkeep, uh, draw. We're gonna goad somebody. Oh, look at that. We've got unsealed and acropolis. I bet unsealed and acropolis hits a creature here. Um, we can always do it at end step though. Um, so we'll pass the turn. End step, we'll go unseal the Acropolis. We're gonna mill one. Come on, give us a creature. Two, oh, damn it. Okay, well, we're just gonna get a Street Wraith back, unfortunately. But you could see how that unseal the Acropolis, if we had any cycling card, would be even better. So we'll get this back. We'll cycle it away for two life and we'll draw. Um, and then, which we might have wanted to do during our turn because, um, because then we can play the land that we got. Yeah, let's just say we did it that way. And then we'll just uh, pay three to, um, say we pay two to Crypt Rats the board of anything important. Anybody that can apply pressure on us would be absolutely demolished by a Crypt Rats on three. So this is probably the last time that works. In fact, Crypt Rats might have died and in which case we got it back with Unseal because this is so scary, like this repeat source of removal, just like really dumpsters a lot of decks. So if we said that died, then it would actually make sense that we got it back. Um, and then maybe this right here is Fiery Cannonade instead. Let's just do that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we still are holding the initiative. We'll go draw on upkeep. That was a good draw. And we'll draw for turn. One, two, three, play Unstable Obelisk. And then we'll go one, two, three, four, four Faceless Butcher. And we're gonna exile somebody's commander. And then we probably have to do some blocking here, although the Crypt Rats kind of swept the board last turn, so nothing's attacking us just yet. So upkeep, I'm gonna assume we kept the, the initiative and we're gonna do this. Hopefully we hit a Monarch creature here. There we go. Put enough Monarch and Initiative cards in your deck and you will hit it off Throne of the Dead 3. Like two color Monarch and Initiative is so strong. Wow, Gary is super fucked up. Um, You know, the funny thing though is that while Gary is an amazing hit here, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, Thorn of the Black Rose is what we need. Um, and it just makes an amazing blocker. We need the cards right now. So we're gonna go bottom, shuffle, draw. Um, and we'll go one, two, three, Crypt Rats. 
Somebody probably counters this. This is too scary, so it's gonna die. And then we'll go one, two, four, um, Mind Stone. And Mind Stone leaves a Terminate mana up. Um, so we'll draw it end step. And then I think that we're able to hold the initiative here. This is too much. We might have to lose the Faceless Butcher. But like that's a super self-sacrificial attack if you attack into this, right? So I, I don't know. It seems like it would be really hard. Maybe we have to use our Terminate. Um, and then we'll upkeep, untap. Let's go get a Swamp for the uh, initiative. And then we'll draw for turn. Swamp. And then here, we're, oh, we'll probably play Witch's Cottage, actually. Witch's Cottage to put Crypt Rats back on top. And then we can either draw Crypt Rats at end step, or we can um, pay one, sack this, cast it, hold it up. I think that's right. One, sack this. We're a little creature light here, but we've only had one creature recursion spell that really was not good. And then one, two, three, cast Crypt Rats. They probably don't have any counter spells at this point. So now we go one, two, cast uh, Kumbaj Witches, one, two, to crap the Crypt Rats um, to kill somebody or to, to like end their board. We're gonna draw off Monarch, obviously. And then upkeep, we're probably gonna trap somebody at this point. Draw, nice, land, um, one, two, three, for Vicious Battle Rager. Um, and now we're going to draw a card with that. And now we have the flicker up for a lot of these things. We'll go to Monarch. And then during their turn, we probably need to kill something. Let's presume we also need to counter some combo shit. Because it's turn 11. We probably had to use this earlier. And then maybe like we have to flicker something. Although I don't know what the hell they would... Like, how do they attack us right now? Maybe we, like, kill somebody's combo creature. Upkeep, we're going to go Throne of the Dead 3 again. Because uh, we drew off of... No, we, we drew off Monarch. So this is actually the draw or the 4-1, right? Or maybe we... No, no, we are at Throne. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Furnace Host Charger is huge. This is where we end the game, right? Yeah, this is where we end the game. We put Furnace Host Charger into play. One, two, three. Counter, counter. Uh, bottom of the library. Uh, dr oh, we forgot to draw for Monarch last turn. Draw, draw for turn. Uh, land. Two, three, four, five, six. For a Lava Serpent. And you can see, look at this. This is a control deck that like in the late game is going to run people over super, super, super hard. Like, that's so much damage we have on board right now. And this is a, this is a bad hand. This is assuming we got interacted with and that we had to use everything at our disposal to stay alive. We have a feign death to get the Monarch or the Initiative back or to reuse Cardor. We only used Cardor once, but then we built up like an impenetrable wall. Um, so, yeah, like, turn sideways, fuck people up. This is, like, making sure the combo player can't win. Um, yeah, these cyclers. Yeah, Alex says, I love these cyclers. They're disgusting when the game goes late. Yeah, I mean, this is turn 12, but, like, this deck is built to do turn 12 shit. This is, like, you know, you don't care how long the game goes because you're gaining life, you're making people attack each other, they're killing each other. And then you have ways to like suppress the board, generate repeat value, super, super recursive. Um, and these cycler cards, like you just saw there, like I top decked a Lava Serpent and I was like, sure, I'll pay six. Here's my five, five haste. <laughs> Fuck you up, pop, pop, pop. Flip this bad boy, eight, pop, get him. And look, everybody's been hurting each other the whole game. These are, these are great. So um, I think this is great. We're going to do one last one of these just to demonstrate the point because we haven't really gotten another good hand. We've only had like a, a really good hand, um, two bad ones, 
and now we're onto this here. Okay, you can see the land cycler coming into play here because we might not hit our land drop and we're probably not casting this first. I'd love to hit a mana rock here. This is where if we had dark ritual and like 12 mana rocks, we would be able to do more of this kind of stuff, but this is great. Pestilence, not super useful just yet. There, I think uh, we've hit, we're hitting our land drops pretty well. Um, what I'd love to do here is actually go Faceless Butcher, turn five, play Cardur, or maybe turn five, play the Monarch. They attack us, we block with everything, and then we, we Supernatural Stamina to get our Monarch back, and then we Cardur with the Monarch. I think that's the way to go. So we're not gonna cycle this. I think we're hitting our land drops just fine. Um, turn two, yeah, so we'll, we'll just wait. We'll just wait. Yeah, we, I wish we had a rock here. This is where I wish we had more, more rocks. All of them would have accelerated us into this like way sooner. Like turn three, Crimson Fleet Monarch, you know, getting Monarch early um, would have been really good. Um, we're not gonna do anything here either. So like first three turns of the game, we're doing kind of nothing, which is a cons little concerning. I um, think we're gonna just one, two, let's just like, maybe what we do is we like cycle this and then we go and we get a dual land, which we're gonna represent with a swamp because we can tap two, we don't have to hold up mana. Um, play this. Um, again, we're not gonna play the Monarch right away because somebody will just like come and kill us. Um, we could play Pestilence, we could play Cardur. I'd rather play Cardur when I have the Monarch. Um, so we're gonna go Faceless Butcher, kill somebody's commander, untap, swamp, now we go one, two, three, four, Crimson Fleet Commodore, like that, and we have our protection up. So say we use our Supernatural Stamina, we're gonna use it on the Crimson Fleet when it blocks. It's gonna give us a counter, we're gonna retain the Monarch, and we're gonna draw a card with that, of course. And then upkeep, we're gonna play our land. Uh, we have the Monarch now, and this is where we go one, two, Felwar Stone, one, two, three, four, for Cardur, pass a turn, drawing a card, upkeep, draw. Now we have this. And we can use our sweepers. We could just play more creatures. We could go one, two, three, four, five, six for Revolutionist and get back um, the Supernatural Stamina, which um, we can't use to sack a creature and bring it back, but that's the the... That's the, the, that's the juice right there, if we could, if we had a way to discard this right now. Like if we discarded it at end step. Ooh, that's a cool thing you can do. You can madness these off of having a full hand. Um, yep, so we probably have to block here. We're probably gonna lose a lot of stuff. And actually maybe we don't because we have this in hand. So we like let somebody take the Monarch and then we draw. Yeah, we're gonna let somebody have the Monarch here because we can get it back. We got big creatures, we got a way to gain it. So we're gonna go to combat first. Um, with all this stuff, we're gonna hit somebody and then we're gonna go, um, gonna get the Monarch. Or alternatively, instead of getting the Monarch that way, this is the safer play. We go Crown Hunter Hireling, one, two, three, four, five. And then we hold up these two. So we go draw Gary, very gross. Um, and then say somebody attacks us, then we go Supernatural Stamina, or they, they go to attacks and they're not communicating clearly and we know they're gonna attack us. We go Supernatural Stamina on Cardur, and then we go Nasty End to draw three cards. One, two, three. This comes back into play, goads everybody, they have to attack somewhere else. Um, draw for turn. I think now we wanna go one, two, three, four, potentially cast Pestilence, or we could go one, two, three, four, five, six, cast Chalice for three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Oh, no, we can go four. Yeah, this is the way to go. One, two, three, four. And then tap this and these two for Gary. And now it's really hard to attack us, right? We draw for Monarch, draw for turn. Like, we didn't get any removal. Whoa. Uh, we didn't get any removal this game, so we're, you know, we might have had to have played these things to like clear combo creatures. But you can see we've kind of turned the corner now, right? We have like ungodly amounts of mana. We can go um, one, two, three, pestilence, one, and then we can just like pestilence as much as we want. Uh, we can go one, two, three, four, five, six leaving three open for Pestilence. We want to kill Carduer at this point. We're fine killing these two because we can get them back. Um, so we'll probably just crack Pestilence here, killing these thing, killing a lot of our stuff, but that's fine. We've got Graveyard Recursion, and then this is the other thing I'm paying for. And we, uh, we probably, I don't know, this seems kind of aggressive. Like we could just hold this stuff up. Maybe we attack somebody and then we use Pestilence during somebody else's turn. So we attack like this, and then Pestilence, drawing a card at end step, drawing a card at the beginning. A lot of lands here, but look at this. This is game over. These two cards right now with this amount of mana is super game over. So, okay. I think Hypothesis is probably confirmed here. I still want more rocks. Um, we had plenty of removal. Um, these sweepers definitely felt good. Um, these effects here felt good. These felt good. We did have instances where we had more than one Monarch card, but the nice thing about it was that we could always get rid... We could just lose the Monarch and then play it pre-combat and see if we could get it back. And if we can't, then we just hit somebody. Um, we didn't have as many ways to reuse Cardor as I would have liked. Uh, we really just have these, but that's where the ramp comes in. We're ramping to be able to constantly replay Cardor. Um, the Sacrifice Draw effects kind of... The funny thing about them is that they kind of needed Cardor to be good. Like the uh, Nasty End, I think, is obligatory, but like Reckoner's Bargain and Deadly Dispute didn't feel like they had a great number of targets to hit, but I think that we would need more reps to figure that out. Um, lands felt fine, even though we got fucked on a couple of our draws. Like that shouldn't be happening with all this and 34 lands, but you know, whatever. Um, we could potentially cut Unsealed and Acropolis for a, a rock. Um, we could cut a removal spell. Um, the Edicts probably aren't that good. Um, I think we're going to cut Flesh Bag. You know, the Sweepers can also get rid of things that are hard to kill. So, um, so we'll do that. And then we're going to add a rock back in, which will be... Um, add a rock back in, which would be like Star Compass maybe? Um, the two mana rocks are really good. Um, so let's do, like, how often are we going to have so many cards that we're not just happy to, like, discard some of them? It's probably just fine. This is untapped. So, yeah, we're going to have fine, we're going to be fine on our colors. Let's just do Thought Vessel. I'd love to get one more in, and then I'd also love to, um... Um, how many ways do we have to kill our own thing? Let's just make a, a category for killing Cardor. Um, Because this is actually like kind of important. Um, I want to know how many ways we have to do that. Nasty and oops. And we have um, Reckoner's Bargain for killing Cardor, Deadly Dispute for killing Cardor. I think I've got all of them. Yeah, okay, here. And then what are the other ones? We have, uh, okay, those. Technically, we could do it with Unstable Obelisk, but that's like so mana intensive and ridiculous. Um, 
We have Crypt Rats, which I think we have there. Pestilence kills Cardur. Um, we have all these as ways we can kill Cardur too. Um, I feel like this is the one that's most common though. We don't really want to use our kill spells on our own commander, but we could definitely Blood Frenzy to do that. So we have eight ways to kill Cardur, which kind of matches up with like five Grave Flickers. Man, where's our final slot for ramp? Is it, um, and like Dark Ritual too, like, man. Dark Ritual is going to be kind of a dead draw in some cases, but I think that the the benefit of being able to rush out an initiative or a Monarch card maybe is worth it. The only thing that's kind of funky about that is that like that does sort of, you know, put us in the, in the, in, in like the scary position, you know, where people are, are looking at us and saying, oh, that this person's definitely the, uh, definitely the problem at the table. Um, but I just wanted lots of mana, you know? We've got plenty of draw. We can use it all. Um, we could cut one of these. Uh, Furnace Host Charger, potentially. Oh, we don't have Tortured Existence. I think Tortured Existence is good. But look, Tortured Existence requires, I think, a few more creatures. And um, the problem with Tortured Existence is that it wants to be in a deck where you take a card from your hand that's not good and you tuck it away for something that's better. And we don't really have a mix of stuff. We, we don't have a mix of good and bad creatures. All of our creatures are insane. So it does give us a way to swap something and say, okay, maybe we don't need Ardent Elementalist right now. We'd rather have Crypt Rats. Or maybe we don't have Monarch right now. Somebody took it from us. So we want to get it back and we get back our Crimson Fleet Commodore tucking away maybe like a Faceless Butcher. But like that doesn't feel as good, if you know what I mean. It functionally increases the size of our hand when we have reanimation effects. Yeah, um, we need to cut one more card. We really need to cut like, now is Dark Ritual better than a Mana Rock? I don't know that it is. Like Mana Rocks are good late, but Mana Rocks are good early. Um, Whereas Dark Ritual Late is kind of like a one-time use. This does allow us to do turn two initiative off or Monarch off of um, one. You could even Ardent Elementalist to get it back and then do it again, which is kind of silly, but you can. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five. Five cards that we're happy to put into play like on turn two and six, seven seven cards total that we're happy to put a play, into play on turn three. Um, it does give us some like explosive degeneracy, but boy, that is going to bring a lot of hate down on our head uh, to play Dark Ritual. Um, like if we go turn two initiative or monarch, we are going to be arch enemy for the rest of the game and people are going to forget about the combo player. I don't think that's good. Dark Ritual is a good card. I believe me, I agree, and turboing it out is cool, but I actually don't like the game theory around it. I don't like the game theory around it at all. Um, but we can retain that explosive power to do it if we need to with a star compass. Okay, now we need to make one more cut, which sucks. Um, I, I hate that we have to cut another card here. Um, Okay, what are the worst cyclers here? It's probably, like, I'm not as interested in drawing cards as I am getting lands. So maybe Lava Serpent comes out. Um, plus, like, Furnace Host Charger looks a lot cooler than Lava Serpent, I think. Um, I mean, it is cutting a creature, which, which just really erodes this game plan, where we can, like, draw a ton of cards off of these. And I don't like that. I don't like that. And I don't want to cut any more removal because we're, we're, we've gone a little down on sweepers and removal, which is fine because like, you know, goading, goading allows us to, um, to, we don't have to kill things as much. Like we can save our removal for combo players.
Let's just um, think about something else for a second here. We could cut one of the grave flickers, like fake your own death. Yeah, that's probably what we want to do. In all honesty, like these are really cool, but like, you know, Cardor buys us time to get stuff into play and then we start to use Cardor with stuff like this. We can always just recast Cardor, you know. If this ends up being too light, we can always go back up on it. But I really think that, um, I think that we, uh, I think that we, we, we don't want to worry too much. Now I'm going to fill out this zone right here um, because we want to, I want players who look at this later to know exactly what cards they can tutor for it for. Cardor won't ever get removed from an opponent's spell. I think there aren't, yeah, I, I actually agree. Like Cardor, you don't want to kill Cardor. Like the weird thing about Cardor is it's kind of like Gollum. Like people probably don't attack you. They probably don't kill your commander because they're like, fuck that. Like I don't want to get goaded again. That's a really good game theory point. Maybe, maybe these just aren't where we want to be. I mean, these are very efficient and we do have other stuff that wants to be killed and we can pair them with these sacrifice effects. So they, they are good, but maybe we just want this limited package and ramp is more important. Um, I think that's super rational. Um, let's see about the other cards at four mana. So basically I'll fill out these Demir house guard slots because I like to be able to show people, you know, what are your, like when they're playing the deck, they can pull it up and see exactly what they can tutor for at different mana values, um, which is a pretty wide array of effects in, in all honesty. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why this card is so busted. Like 10 amazing effects like land destruction, initiative monarch, massive draw, initiative sweeper, kill spell. Um, we can even get snuff out with this, which I've done. Um, edicts, get spells back. Yeah, very good. Okay, I like this a lot. Let's run this through one more and see how it feels. What is up with this land stuff? There's like not getting lands. Like if we, it's kind of a, uh, kind of, chat, what? What? 34 lands and 12 rocks. And we have hit so many dysfunctional draws. This is not statistically likely at all. This is like the sixth or seventh hand we've got that, that just doesn't work. That's, this isn't, we, it's kind of like when you play a game and things don't go right and there's nothing you could do about it and you just gotta say, you know what? There's nothing to learn from it. Just move on, go to the next game. All right, this is good. Um, it's a little land heavy, but we can cycle this to see if we can find a rock. Um, so play this out, draw, uh, play this out. We're gonna cycle the Crag Smasher Yeti. Uh, for a swamp. Uh, in this case, this would be a dual land, probably. Uh, or not. Might be a dual land. Maybe not. That's a good draw. So we'll play um, play that land, pay three to cast Network Terminal and ho hold up Scred. We probably don't need it right now, but yeah. And then we draw. Breath Weapon is great. So we're going to go Cardur. And then we've got our Scred if there's somebody's comboing. Um, we probably are going to Mortuary Mire this back on top. So we'll draw for turn. Um, we'd love an Initiative or a Monarch card right now. Um, which means we don't really want to put this back on top. Um, now that people aren't goaded, maybe they come after us. So Breath Weapon is going to be important. And if they come after us, Feign Death is a way they can reuse our commander. So we'll do Mortuary Mire, put this back on top, because we do want to hit our next land drop. And then um, if people come at us, we can always do some stuff. So let's assume that, I mean, it's hard to imagine they'd come after us here because like we don't have the Monarch, we don't have the initiative, they don't want to kill Cardor. I don't think they come after us here at all. Uh, we are probably going to loot with this to put this into play discounted, but we don't have another artifact. So maybe we just sit here and do nothing. Let's just assume we have to like kill something. Okay. Cause maybe somebody's comboing on turn five and then draw. Um, at this point we probably just cast the crag smasher Yeti. But I also like the idea that we, um, You know, we could go one, two, cycle this, 
uh, get a land, cast Gary. Just to gain a little bit of life and then have another creature in play. And they're still not gonna, they're, they're not gonna wanna attack us because they don't wanna reset this. Or we could go skip this, say we wanna cast this instead. And let's go instead and, and cast this. This hand's a little awkward because there's like things that we wanna do that we can't, like we can't loot this away to madness it. You know, we wanna cast this, but we're kind of missing land drops. We wanna, you know, cycle this to play the land for this so that we can do it, but the mana doesn't work out. But in the same vein, it's turn six and they're probably not attacking us. So we'll, we'll, we'll tap out there. Um, there could have been an argument for cycle Crag Smasher Yeti. So maybe we go, uh, let's do this instead. This feels a little more conservative. We'll go cycle Crag Smasher Yeti, go and get a swamp. Um, in this case, it would be a swamp. Uh, play that swamp out and then hold up mana because there's things happening and we might need to stop them. So we have these two answers. Um, and then we'll draw a card for next turn. Lava Serpent's good. Um, we're going to pitch Lava Serpent, I think, because we want to see what we're going to get here. Draw a card. Horror of the Broken Land. So now we're actually filling our yard pretty quickly. So we can go one for um, cycling Horror of the Broken Lands. Draw a card. Wow. Okay, there's our land. Um, one, cycle this for a Swamp. Play that Swamp. And we've got mana up to reuse our creature if we need to. We can Breath Weapon. Um, there's some stuff we can do here. We're loading this up. This is going to be an amazing Reaping the Graves. Um, so say we had to Breath Weapon. Just because I, I think that's a likelihood at this point. And then we're going to draw. Um, at this point, I think like we're playing hard control now. One, two, three, four, five, six. To get back... Um, to play Revolutionist, and we're gonna get back Victim of Night. And what we, yeah, we couldn't do it the other way, but we're gonna get back Victim of Night, so we have this up. Pass turn, and this doesn't look that impressive, but we've actually, we're able to contain what's happening on the board, and we're not threat number one. We're not developing, we're not goading everybody. They don't wanna attack us because they don't wanna give us another card or trigger. And we're just drawing cards. So this is fine. This kind of looks like Witherbloom Apprentice right now. Um, now we can go one, two, develop our mana a little bit. One, two, three, four, five to cast Gary. We're just going to gain nine life. It's okay. Um, and then we have Victim of Night up. Pass turn, use Victim of Night to kill something. Draw. Man, we need a Monarch or Initiative card yesterday. Uh, we're going to cycle here, or, um, or like loot, I guess, to draw a card. We don't want that. And we just sit here with mana up. That's fine. Um, you know, we can always kill our own thing if people come after us. This is bad, but draw. More lands. Kind of shitty. Uh, actually, in this case, we're going to go one, two, three, loot. Uh, pitch this, although actually we don't have any Artifact Matters things, so we'll pitch the um, Rakdos Signet and just play the land. Uh, we probably need to use our Scred, probably need to use our, our Wrecking Ball at this point, um, and then draw. Yeah, I don't know. One, two, three, draw. There's Faceless Butcher. Um, so we'll go one, two, three, four, Faceless Butcher. We got that. Draw. Yeah, so you can see like this game, we probably didn't die to combo, um, but it's turn 13 and we're kind of slowly building up this board of creatures that people probably don't want to kill because they know we can bring them back. Um, and we have the ability to reuse them if they did. Like if anybody came and attacked us, we throw this under the bus, feign death, or throw this under the bus, feign death. Um, you know, now we're just one, like I think now we go one, two, three, four, five, six, and just cast Twisted Abomination. And at this point, people are gonna be like really low health, but they're also gonna be like, ooh, Cardoor hasn't been getting a lot of focus. We should probably do something about that. Um, so probably coming after us, we have money to, or you know, mana to regenerate. Draw spell, yeah. Um, pay one, loot, terminate. So 
yeah, pretty controlling hand. We didn't draw any of our like 24 draw spells in the deck, which is kind of silly. Um, and we would have liked to, but again, they're in the deck. Um, we would be able to get these back pretty easily. We can facilitate our own reaping the graves. So if we drew a couple more cards, yeah, like, you know, these two would draw us one, two, three, yeah, and then wander and death. We can get these back, you know, so there's stuff to do there. Okay. So with that in mind, I think we're going to wrap things up here. I think this is a really cool deck. Um, this is a deck I would play for sure. This is right up there with like Thrall Parasite in terms of being hyper grindy, except that in the command zone, you have a way to make everybody just smack each other, um, which is really cool. So uh, we have a nice package of a single, you know, basically answers to combo. We have a lot of instant speed removal. We have some Staxi type things like the Kumbaj, which is the Pestilence, the Crypt Rats that can really deny people stuff. We have a lot of instant speed free stuff that we can use. Um, we have a lot of ways to reuse the card door if we want. Um, a, just a metric shit ton of draw, great number of sweepers here, um, and then a ton of Monarch and Initiative. And you can tell that like in a lot of games we'll go like turn two rock, turn three Monarch or Initiative, turn four card door, make everybody attack each other, hit somebody, take the Monarch back or the Initiative back. Um, a reasonable number of lands, tons of recursion along with these creatures here. A revolutionist, I'll admit, didn't feel very good. It was a lot of mana. Um, this is a lot of mana for whatever spell you're going to get back. But we have to keep in mind that this paired with this or Wander and Death and Revolutionist or Revolutionist Art and Elementalist with any of these flickers is really good, as well as just like Siphon Mind, um, you know, or, you know, some of these other draw spells like Nasty End. Um, and then we just have this really hyper consistent way to like cycle our cards to get them back and draw more. So it feels like the kind of deck that should never run out of gas. Um, you know, if it ends up running out of gas a little bit, maybe we cut Revolutionist and we bring back in something like Read the Bones uh, because it's okay for us to pay a little bit more mana to, you know, to do the thing. Oh, somebody's clicking the heart button. Who's clicking the heart button? Hey, you stop that. You stop that. Stop it. I love that. You guys can see in the bottom right, somebody's spamming the heart button. What if everyone in chat spammed the heart button right now? It'd probably look kind of ridiculous, wouldn't it? Pretty funny. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Validation. Approval. Oh, yes. Good. <laughs> All right. I think with that, we are going to wrap this up. Uh, man, I, I really want to play a game right now. Is that is that ridiculous? It's like late. It's a Sunday. I haven't played any Magic for like fucking a, a week. I don't know. Who all is here? If three people want to play right now, I would consider pushing my bedtime for a game. Alex says, I want to, but I'm at work. Yeah, that is sad. Um, but thank you for being here while you're at work. That is a level of dedication um, that uh, that I respect. It's a real uh, connoisseur there of the finest common cardboard. Um, yeah, I'll wait for another couple minutes here. If people, uh, if anyone's interested in that, raise your hand, um, and we can we can get get a game going. I would love to like actually like test this out right now. <laughs> I want to actually play Shadow Facts too. That's the funny thing. Um, like what I want to do more than anything else, but it's the help desk gig. Oh, right. I'm literally doing nothing. I don't have any calls. Yeah, right. But you probably don't have the ability to like play in front of you. Unless, of course, you brought your webcam to work. Install OBS on your work computer. <laughs> it's a thing you could do. I'm not I'm not trying to encourage, uh, you know, time stealing or... Uh, any anti, you know, any anti-employer behavior here, but, uh, you know, you do you, you do you. You know what? While we're here, I'm not done with y'all. I, uh, I kind of want to flex, um, shadow facts because this, this deck just gives me a raging erection to, uh, to play. It's, it's, it's too sweet. Um, okay. 
this is a decent opening hand. No mana rocks, though. We do have a way to find protection with Heliod's Pilgrim. And Soltari Visionary, which is great. Pretty slow. Pretty slow. Um, we'll probably play Heliod's Pilgrim off of this. And we're going to search up Benevolent Blessing. Actually, we'll search up, uh, yeah, Benevolent Blessing. I wish there was a one mana aura that was instant speed that protected things, but there just ain't. Um, so we'll play this, cast this. Uh, we could cast the Crimson Acolyte, actually, and then if we hit our next land drop. This is a little bit slow, admit. There's, there's nothing to resurrect, unfortunately. Usually we have a cycling card in here. Um, so we'll go this just for a little protection that's one mana. So if we hit our sixth, we can do that. Okay. Yep. No mana rocks. This feels a little dumb, but you know, we're just getting kind of dicked on the mana. Shadow, uh, Alex says, if we want to play Shadow Facts next game, then I can play this for a test. That'd be something different for me for sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a very sad hand. This is not demonstrating what the deck does. Again, no lands because I'm fucking cursed tonight. Okay. This, this right here we can do. This deck also has the turn three Monarch thing. So play that. Draw, sick, play Arcane Signet, draw. And this deck, we don't care about giving the Monarch pe to people. It's it's perfectly fine. Um, so what we're going to do is actually go Lantern of Revealing. Because we don't need to do the Monarch until we're out of cards. This is not a deck that wants to turbo this kind of stuff unless we need, the, like, need creatures. And we have creatures that we can flip into play. So we're going to play the Rock, hope to draw another land. That's fine. False Defeat's good. Um... So we can go one, two, three, four, five to cast Shadow Facts. Now this is without protection, but um, but sometimes we'll do that. That's okay. If it if it doesn't if it gets countered, like look at all this chonky stuff we can play turn after turn. So it's gonna come in. Um, we're not gonna get the counter unfortunately, but I think what we're gonna do is flip it in with Bassery's Acolyte, um, because what we're gonna do here is we're gonna pump up the power on this and pump up the power on this so that we can uh, flip larger things into play. Draw land? Nope, okay. Get get wrecked me. Um, one, two, if we cycle this and we get a land, we can actually false defeat it into play. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go cycle this with upside basically. Land? God damn it. Um, get wrecked me. Um, we need to find a land, so we're actually going to prioritize this uh, because we can reanimate this. So we're going to go and get a planes. Um, we're just figuring our mana is perfect right now. We're going to uh, go to combat, swing with these. I think we're going to put the uh, Faragax Giant into play. We could actually play the Crimson Fleet Commodore. No, we can't because we, we can't flip it. Um, we could do the, uh, the Faragax Giant's probably it. Faragax Giant's a really cool card because what we can do is we can look at the player who has the most life and an aggro player who doesn't care about their life total, who wants everybody else dead, and say, hey, would you like to take five? And they say, sure. And you uncounterably nug the table for five. Because we actually want this to come in as a 3-3. And then we'll draw land. No land. So dumb. So dumb that we're not drawing lands right now. At, like at all in any of these games. It just feels like really statistically unlikely that we would have that problem. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go um, the Raptor. We're gonna uh, buff this um, to six, uh, six power. And then we'll also buff the, um, I think it'll be the, not the Faragax, cause we can always bring that back if it dies in combat. We can do the Raptor, cause I like having a three, three flying. And then we go to combat with all this stuff, and we flip the uh, Crown Hunter higher or the um, Crimson Fleet Commodore off of Shadowfax, gain the Monarch. Um, we're gonna draw a card at end step. She's not even a land. Crazy, absolutely insane. Um, the other thing we could have done actually that would have been more mana efficient is we instead of playing this, we reanimate this. But I think I want to reanimate this for a closer. So um, no land, still no land. <laughs> in, 
in the deck with like seven ways to find lands and 34 of them. It's just so, so sad. Um, so we're gonna go uh, Mind Stone into a five mass spell, which I think we're just gonna go one, two, three, four for Relief Captain. And we're gonna put counters on this, counters on, um, probably counters on this. I really like the idea of spreading the love out and then counters on this, like that. Um, or we could go Faragax Giant. I think Crimson Fleet Commodore is gonna die anyways. So we wanna, we basically wanna put this on stuff that isn't the target of removal. And say somebody interacts with us, we can uh, Red Elemental Blast. And then we go to combat, flip this Anointer of Valor into play, and look at all the power we're swinging for on turn seven. This is like huge. And now we don't even care if we have cards because Anointer of Valor is gonna be a mana sink to make our board bigger. We'll draw for Monarch. At this point, Shadowfax probably died, um, but you know, untap. Now we have the Oliphant. Uh, we can flip Oliphant into play if we give this one more power, which we can do with Crag Smasher Yeti. So we go one, two, three, four for this. Bring back Crag Smasher Yeti. Buff the power on this right here two more, which is a lot at this point. Go to combat. Somebody tries to kill it. We uh, show Mano's Blessing. And then we flip Oliphant into play, which when it attacks, so it's an attack trigger where if we flip it into play, it's not actually attacked, it is attacking. Um, so it won't give itself a buff or anything else, but it will be uh, an attack trigger. And we're gonna get these counters here. These counters could have gone elsewhere. You know, we could have done different things this turn, um, but like we're swinging for just a stupid amount of damage right now. Draw a card at Monarch. Draw a card, cycle this away, because now we don't want lands. We just want creatures. Um, we can go land, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Cast this for three, like that. And then pay one, two, three to look, uh, tap this and flip a card, um, we're gonna keep this on top. Um, and then we'll go to combat, do our thing. This is so much damage. Draw a card at end step. The way we would do this actually is we would do this right now after we draw a card. So flip nothing, okay. Um, and we go to end new, next turn, yeah. So you can see the point here. Um, yeah, here's another case where the land, finding the land is huge because it's gonna get us to four. So we'll draw a card, uh, play land, next turn. Um, in this case, yeah, we will cycle it. Cycle this to get a planes. We're just assuming our mana is perfect. Get a land into hand. Draw a card for next turn. Uh, Lantern of Revealing. Oh, this does mean we can't play the turn five one. Um, I got a call, very nice person. So we're gonna play this. Uh, we could also go. We could go one, two, cycle this to draw a card, and then we could go play this. Draw for turn, and then we go land into. We might have actually um, suspended this. Yeah. One two, three, for Lantern of Revealing. And then we'll go, um, or if it's a Gretchen player, we'll probably play this out. Um, and we might actually put this into um, Suspend. So turn, turn five comes around and we can cast our commander which is, you know, turn five commander, not the greatest, but usually this thing's gonna come in around turn five and there's a whole bunch of other stuff we're playing in between. Um, so go to combat, swing. We're probably gonna put, um, we'll probably put like uh, Shrine Steward into play and grab a remo like a, a protection spell. So Chomano's Blessing. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, once they know they have this, this will die at end step, but that's fine because we can Opal Palace it back. Um, draw this, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, cast this again. Although we would love to be able to cast this with one more up so that we can free flip the four power creatures. <coughs> I think this turn we just do some developing. Play this. Three, four, five. Celebrants. Oh, we don't want that. We want blood tokens. Like that. <coughs> There's the land. So now we go tap this, flip this into play, scry one. Um, yeah, we kind of like that on top. Um, and it's going to come in with two counters. And then we attack. We're going to put this into play, probably attacking with these. You know, there might have been a world where maybe we don't do Opal Palace. I think that's actually it. We don't do Opal Palace and we hold up um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we hold this up for Crimson Acolyte. And then I think we're going to cycle away the Soltari Visionary to draw a card. This thing probably comes into play next turn. Uh, draw. And then draw comes into play. Um, now what we can do is go one, two, Felwar. One, two, three, four. Oh, it doesn't work. So we actually have to skip Felwar Stone. We're going to do Bonder's Ornament. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Draw creature. There we go. And then what we'll do is we'll attack. We'll flip Scouting Hawk into play. Go get a Plains. This thing's going to do this. By the way, if you're in white and you don't know about this card, um, you should know about it. If an opponent you uh, control an opponent controls more lands, search your library for a basic planes card, put it into battlefield tapped. So a lot of times this is going to be a ramp, ramp spell. Not a great thing to flip into play, but we're able to attack here pretty good. This thing is kind of tapping these things down, which sucks, but generally that's not the case. Um, we'll pay one sacrifice this and actually before we put this into play we should cycle this to see what we get okay nothing that nothing that we care about so yeah um that might have been different if we hadn't shuffled already but yeah <clears throat> commander sphere so you can see the point here basically and what we haven't seen is the turns where you go like turn one cycle a creature into your graveyard turn two mana rock turn three reanimate turn four commander flip something into play, three creatures, tons of power, tons of value. Um, we haven't seen one of those yet. This is actually pretty good here. Like draw, Sacred Peaks, draw. Would have loved to have hit an untapped land there. We shouldn't be hitting, like missing land drops right now. It's, it's kind of infuriating that we are. Um, we'll probably go, we don't have a ton of creatures, so we're going to hold on to this to free cast it. So we'll put Bonner's Ornament into play. And then uh, we're going to go one, two, Rock, one, two, Scouting Hawk. Put this land into play. And then uh, we actually have Cloud Shift, which I kind of want to use on, on this Hawk. But I don't think anybody has more lands than us right now. That's the only thing that's a bummer. So... We'll draw. I like the land there. One, two, three, four, five. Cast the commander. Somebody could interact with us. We have this, this uh, to stop them. So let's just say we go Benevolent Blessing. And then we're going to flip this into... Actually, I think we flip... Um, yeah, we'll do Ivory Giant. Tap them down. Swing. Draw, um, in this case here, we're actually probably just going to hard cast this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Crack Smasher Yeti is going to give this thing some counters. We could also put it on the Scouting Hawk. Um, if we don't want to put, you know, make this a juicy target, which it kind of is. Uh, we'll flip this into play off the attack trigger. 
go and get Shomano's Blessing. Like that, say we had to counter something here. Uh, we'll counter it. Uh, draw for turn. One, two, three, four. Uh, tap this to draw a card. No creature and nothing to cycle away just yet, but we do have protection up. Um, yeah, I can go, go to combat with all this stuff here. And then if something happens, we can flicker, like flickering this, or Cho Manos to protect again. Crimson Fleet Commodore, okay. One, two, three. Lantern of Revealing, attack, put this into play, gain the Monarch, attacking with all this stuff here. Um, one, two, three, four. So we're, we're going to draw it and step for Monarch, and then we're going to draw with this. And then upkeep. Somebody may have actually interacted with this at this point, so we'll put it to the command zone. Um, they may have found a way to bounce it or something like that. It was probably bounce because whatever removal we stopped was probably most of the removal at the table. So let's say it was bounced. So we'll do that, and we'll go one, two, three, four, five, uh, Shadow Fax. Um, and we have all this protection. Um, probably flip this into play. Go to combat, flip the Tuboxi Tuckaneers, do some combat stuff. Um, say somebody tried to kill it, we protect it again. Um, for two, and then we can pay two to flicker with, uh, with this right here. Flicker our uh, Crag Smasher Yeti, or we could flicker the Ivory Giant. Um, let's do the Yeti. So we increase the power on this, like that. This is now an exile. Draw a card for Monarch. Draw a card for the other turn. Planes, we're gonna sandbag this until this dies again. Um, and now we'll go one, two, three, four. Draw a card, no creature. Um, oh, that's why we saved this. And we go Idyllic Grange, they've already interact with this a few times, but I think we'll go counter on this thing. And then we can one, two, three, four, five, four, five. Wait, one, two, three. Oh no, we can cast this. Yep, cast this, attack. This is gonna cause something to leave. So we'll make a Pegasus token. <coughs> Draw a card for Monarch. There we go. Yeah. So you can see this deck like snowballs a little bit. Um, there are a lot of like turn four shadow faxes usually because we have 12 mana rocks and we have all these ways to find our lands. We have 34 lands. Um, so lots of ways to snowball. We have actually a surprising number of like card advantage spells, uh, you know, into our mana rocks attached to ETBs that we can flicker as well as like the Monarch and the initiative. Most things come into play without any buff on Shadow Facts, but there's a small number of them where you need to get the power a little bit higher. And in my experience, I'm actually perfectly fine to just cast Crimson Fleet Commodore or some five, six power thing and then flip another thing into play for free. So, anywho, uh, that's the deck. With that, I think we are going to wrap things up here. Um, for everybody who is still here, I know this is a long stream, but I hope you all have been enjoying it. The Cardoor build was really fun. I'm uh, confident in this deck. It's a good example of how control definitely is not dead. Um, and I'm excited to get some reps in with it. That's a deck that I'd probably like to build in paper so that I have a couple more control decks up my sleeve um, in, in paper for my battle box. Um, now, as we wrap up here, um, I do want to let you all know that if you've enjoyed this content, please do the easy thing. Give us a like subscribe, hit the little notification bell if you want to be notified of streams like this one where I just had a hair, you know, a harebrained idea. I wanted to do it. I was impatient and, uh, you know, and I, and I you know, made a little thumbnail and threw it up for you. And if you want to be notified about those kinds of live streams, make sure to hit the bell icon on that subscription. And of course, before we end, I do want to give a special shout out to our patrons who make all of this possible, who validate 
this experiment that Clay, or, Clay and I are doing and uh, really just make us feel warm and fuzzy inside for, um, for all the support you all give us. So um, the Sanctuary PDH, Jack, Eric, Adgen, Jerry, Zach, Scooby, Chris, Mizu, William, Paul, Corey, Derek, Devin, Ian, Bobby, and Gin Shooting Star, and our longest running patron, Noyark. Thank you so much for all of your contributions. Um, I really appreciate all of you. If you too are interested in joining the Patreon, let me show you exactly how to do it. You can go to patreon.com backslash common connoisseurs. And here you will have all of the options. You have uh, anywhere from $2 a month, $5 a month, pretty affordable. Um, you know, it's like a cup of coffee for this one, maybe half a cup of coffee for this one to get access to the exclusive part of the Discord. We also have a $10 a month option, which offers you an enormous amount of value, whether it's the interfaces that you see around me here, which I'll custom make for you with your name on it. It'll still look the same as mine, but it'll have your name on it, um, which are really valuable. If you go to owned.gg and you try to buy these, they're 50 to 100 bucks for something that won't necessarily have your name on it. Um, and so um, I offer these to all of our patrons who do $10 a month. And even if you did it for only one month, you would actually still get, and you'd be able to keep those files. So uh, consider doing that um, as a way to support the channel. Um, also, I just wanted to show you another thing, which is that uh, for those of you who are interested in getting access to kind of like the pre-show notes, you can get access to the exclusive members only part of the Discord by going and subscribing as a patron. And in here, you'll see that under early access, there's actually conversations happening already about all of these cool decks that are gonna be upcoming streams before they ever happen. So if you wanted to get in on Theoden, if you wanted to get in on Shadowfax or on Elrond, which we haven't done yet, um, or on Denethor, which is coming up, or on Cardur, I'm, I'm posting them there a week ahead of time. And the connoisseurs, all the supporters are able to comment. They're able to you know, offer input. They're able to see what's going to happen ahead of time, which allows you to really increase the mark you leave on these live streams as a community member. And it kind of becomes more of your deck, which is really awesome. Um, and so uh, we have early access here. You also get early access to our gameplay videos. We have a couple days in between when you see them and when other people see them. Um, we also have a deck list section, which is really, really cool. This is a very well curated list of basically decks from me, decks from Clay, stuff that we're working on that's really spicy, as well as members of the community, people like you who can post in here. It's super well organized. It's all searchable, like a compendium up here by searching. Uh, there's different tags that allow you to see it. The other thing we do too is that I'm really interested in like human optimization, whether it's through health, wellness, mental health, fitness. Um, as well as just great podcasts that I like to listen to. So we have a section here called Human Advancement, where all the podcasts that I listen to go up here. You can discuss them. You can read them. It's a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so, And then the last thing is if you too want to create content, if you go at that $10 level, not only do you get all these interfaces here, but you get access to all this stuff that I'm learning as I fail um, about how to make better content, whether it's through thumbnail design, whether it's through you know, uh, how to maximize engagement based on ChatGPT's recommendations, uh, whether it's like Twitter image thumb, you know, like sizes and things like that, or podcasts that tell you how to stream better. Um, so there's a lot of value in the supporters only section. But without harping too much on what you can do to support this stuff, I'm um, going to respond to a couple more comments and we're going to wrap it up. Cla uh, Alex says, if you want to play Shadow Facts next game, I can play for the test. Oh, yeah, right. Um, oh, wait, no, that wasn't a new comment. Yeah, same things. Cool, cool. All right, um, yeah, so you can go here to get that. There's also some higher level stuff. We don't expect people to do these, but we do make them available for people who might just be like of a lot of means, people who maybe are really deeply impacted by what we're doing and want to you know, step up their support in some way. Um, I understand that this is a lot of money, but for some people it's really not. And that's why we have the option there. Um, I know, you know I, I've watched a live stream a couple days ago where there were like at least 10 or 12 people who donated like $100 or more to a single live stream of a person who was like drinking and playing a Warhammer 40k game and people were like they liked his content and they just did it and it was like wow we need to have those options available to people and so if you do if you are interested and you are of means and you feel like motivated and compelled by what we're doing here um, this does include an hour of monthly 
coaching and deck tuning specifically for me where I will dedicate an hour of focused attention to helping you optimize whatever you're doing. I can also sit in in a game on call where nobody can hear me. You can mute yourself when you want to talk to me and I can backseat you. Um, it includes all of the other things we talked about. It's going to include exclusive video game content and you'll get guaranteed member only games with Clay and I um, throughout the month. So um, this is a very high value, but again, it's expensive. So um, I don't expect that of any of you. Um, okay. So with that, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate you all sticking around. For those of you who are still here, you're a hero. Um, I know this is a long stream, but I love doing this stuff. So um, if you, yeah, I hope you all are having a great rest of your day. Um, hope you have a great Monday and a great start to your work week. And yeah, with that, we're going to sign off. Connoisseurs of Fine Common Cardboard, love you all. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and we'll catch you on the flip side. See you on the battlefield. Peace.